So history and facts going up through 1890. <laughs> <laughs> Who got the truth? Is it you? Is it you? Is it you? Who got the truth now? Is it you? Is it you? Is it you? Sit me down, say it straight. Another story on the way. Who got the truth? Welcome to season nine, episode four of Acquired the podcast about great technology companies and the stories and playbooks behind them. I'm Ben Gilbert, and I'm the co-founder and managing director of Seattle-based Pioneer Square Labs and our venture fund, PSL Ventures. And I'm David Rosenthal, and I am an angel investor based in San Francisco. And we are your hosts. Today's episode is 150 years in the making. David, somehow we missed this IPO, if or when it <laughs> happened. <laughs> can we get uh, can we can we still get uh, get secondary shares? We'll see. Put together we'll a see. little SPV. I, I, do, I think uh... it might be of a spinoff or something uh, like that okay. At, okay. Uh, at at this point. Uh, at least the Standard Oil that we will cover today never IPO'd. It was privately held the whole time. Its financials were kept very secret. That that must be why we we have missed it until now, David. Uh, sure. Yeah, must be. Must be. Well, this episode on Standard Oil is, of course, the oil monopoly founded in the 1870s by John D. Rockefeller, the wealthiest person in modern human history. Embarrassingly, until I had started to do the research, I didn't realize the oil in Standard Oil did not refer to gasoline, at least until much, much later in the life of the company. Standard Oil actually... Model T was like 1910 or so, like... Totally. Standard Oil predates the Ford Model T by like 40 years. Yeah. So wild. So yeah, John D becomes the wealthiest person in like, you know, modern human history before gasoline. Yeah. <laughs> gasoline helped kind of later. Oil. Turns out compounding, uh, compounding can kind of show up, especially when the second business line gets layered on top, but we will get into it. Listeners, the other thing that is crazy that I want to point out, I didn't realize how much Standard Oil is very much with us today. Despite being famously broken up, the parts went on to become both Exxon and Mobil, Marathon, Amoco, which of course is now a part of BP, Chevron, and several other companies. When you look at a gas station, you are probably looking at some remnant of, uh, of Standard Oil. Just wild. Just wild. We will get much more into that next time. Yep. So this one will be at least a two-parter. It turns out the company responsible for creating the entire modern energy industry has a lot of wild stories. So uh, we uh, we will, uh, in part one here, just go through probably the Sherman Antitrust Act, but we'll see how far we get. Yeah, we're going to talk about Standard Oil today, and then next time will be Legacy. All right. Before we dive in, I would like to welcome our presenting sponsor for all of Season 9, Pilot.com. Pilot is the backbone of the modern financial stack for startups and is backed themselves by all-star investors like Sequoia, Index, Bezos Expeditions, and Stripe. They are truly the gold standard for startup bookkeeping. They are truly the gold standard for startup bookkeeping. Ben, do you know who else started their career as a bookkeeper? John D. John D. Rockefeller. That's right. Today, he would have started his career working for Pilot. <laughs> uh, so great. Now, over to our conversation with Pilot co-founders Wasim Daher and Jessica McKellar. So for nearly every technology startup, finance and accounting is not one of the things that matter and that you should do in-house. So this is not a new idea. Startups have been outsourcing their finance and accounting for decades. What changed that enabled you to actually build Pilot as a technology company around this? So I think there are really two trends that enable Pilot to exist now, sort of at this unique moment in time. The first is really the rise of fintech, the rise of SaaS, the rise of the cloud and this back office stuff. Meaning even 10 years ago, if you look at the landscape, Stripe didn't really exist. Expensify didn't really exist. Gusto didn't exist. Your bank statement was literally a thing that arrived in an envelope at your home or your office. So the fact that there are these best of breed electronic systems that you can use to help you run your back office and that they all have APIs is what enables a key portion of what we do, which is the ability to programmatically ingest and transform data from a variety of data sources. The second thing, though, I think is really a shift in the consumer's behavior. 
which is that again, you know, even 10 years ago, probably what the business owner wanted to do was to go downtown with the shoebox of receipts to visit their accountant in person and, you know, talk to them in a office with a lot of mahogany or whatever. And actually what the business owner wants now is the convenience of it being done electronically, of being done well, of being able to take care of this stuff, you know, it's Saturday at 11 p.m. in their pajamas. Amazing. Yeah. I don't know too many founders who are excited to go <laughs> down to their accountant's office these days. Exactly. Wonderful. You can learn more about Pilot and whether they can help your company eliminate the pain of tax prep and bookkeeping by going to pilot.com slash acquired. And thanks to Wasim and Jessica, all acquired listeners, if you use that link, will get 20% off your first six months of service. Super excited to have y'all with us this season. And uh, seriously, go check them out. They're the best. For sure. Love Pilot. All right. Well, listeners, before David takes us in, as always, this show is not investment advice. David and I may have investments in the companies we discuss. This is for Unlikely information, in <laughs> entertainment. Uh, yeah. If, if you go look, it, let us know if you find the Standard Oil stock ticker. You know, we, we'd, uh, we'd love to go check it out, evaluate. No. Um, yeah. Without further ado, Standard Oil. Maybe PitchBook has some data on them. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, well, before we dive in here, um, we owe like a thank you, like a shout out, love. We we just owe love. I just want to give a lot of love to Ron Chernow, who is one of like America's just like greatest historians, biographer of Hamilton, biographer and. Uh, he wrote, he wrote the book that Hamilton's based on the he wrote play, the book right? That Hamilton is based on, yep, yeah. and also wrote Titan, the biography, the definitive biography of John Davis and Rockefeller. That is the main source for this episode. Like seriously, I know we talk about a lot of books on this this show, but like, pause this podcast right now. <laughs> go get this book in your preferred, you know, hard. This book is Kindle. epic. It's so it's, good. It's so good. So good. In fact, without Chernow's work, we probably would not have ended up doing an episode on this. Like this, the, the book was good enough that it sort of uh, <laughs> emboldened David and I, two tech podcasters, to say, you know what feels like it's within the scope of our show? A two part series on Standard Oil. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so thank you, and and uh, I, I got to. I think the perfect place to to start is with a with one of Chernow's one of Ron's quotes at the very beginning in the introduction to Titan where he says, the story of John D. Rockefeller transports us back to a time when industrial capitalism was raw and new in America and the rules of the game were unwritten as yet. Oh boy. <laughs> and this is just like, I think more than anything we've covered on this show, like Standard Oil wrote the rules, like all the rules that we assume, that we just assume are the rules the way business is done the way business is done the unwritten rules they wrote the unwritten rules and then you know congress wrote the rules about them but <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll get to that we'll get to that <laughs> yeah i mean the, the the era that you're thinking that we should think of here you know this isn't the wild wild west this is the wild wild east like we're 30 40 years after our nation was founded here in the early 1800s the freaking civil war hasn't even happened yet nope no Texas, no California. Yes, yeah, certainly early in corporate law, but we're early in like all forms of human organization in uh, in the United States. <laughs> law? What is law? Uh, speaking of, okay, so we start in 1810 in New York, in Ancrum, New York, which is actually like not that far from Manhattan. It's about two hours by car north of Manhattan. But back in those days was a different world. Uh we start there with the birth of William Avery Rockefeller. Big Bill. Big, big Bill. Uh, he would also go on to have a, another nickname. A big Bill was one. He was, he was a large man. Um, his other nickname was Devil Bill. <laughs> uh, not as kind. Which he got because of his profession that he would grow up to um, participate. Of course, we're, we're talking about John Rockefeller's father here. Um, Devil Bill, Big Bill, was literally a snake oil salesman. You know, like people use the term like, oh, like, uh, you know, oh, Ben, he's a snake oil salesman. Like, no, no, no. Like, Bill. This sold, is where the term comes from. He sold medicines <laughs> out of his like pack that he rode into town on a horse that like professed to be a doctor, but, you know, they didn't do it and then he didn't do anything. And then he got out of town before anybody realized. <laughs> oh, wow. That was his profession. So one day when he is 26 years old, 
in 1836, he rolls into a new unsuspecting community to offload his uh, his his uh, goods on, shall we say, Richford, New York, which is in far, far, far away in central New York <laughs> state. Uh, and um, there he encounters the Davison family. And uh, the Davisons are, are quite, quite unlike Bill and the Rockefeller. You They're know, upstanding. Clan. They are upstanding. They are devout, religious, Christian followers, extremely religious, very puritanical, uh, one might say, in their attitudes and mores, except for the fact that they are Baptists. We're going to talk about that more in one sec. But they're like, for the moment, they are they are quite different than Bill's. Uh, they have a different moral compass than Bill, shall we say. Well, yeah, and they're wealthy. <laughs> that is the other thing. They are quite wealthy. So Bill's, Wild Bill's, Young Bill's, Big Bill's eyes light up when he sees the Davison Ranch. And he, uh, <laughs> so the story goes, I think this is actually true. One of his like um, sort of tricks of the trade, uh, if you will, was he would perfect, he would pretend to be deaf uh, and he would carry like a, like a chalk slate around his neck and write on it and pretend to be deaf and couldn't speak. And he's at the Davison house and he's you know, doing this little charade and he hears the, uh, I think eldest, no, second eldest daughter of the Davisons, a woman named Eliza, pretty young girl, say, uh, uh, I would marry that man if he weren't deaf and dumb. <laughs> and miraculously, Ew. oh my God, the beauty of young Eliza cures Bill of his affliction and he can speak and he can hear. Amazing. So the uh, patriarch of the Davison family, one John Davison, uh remember that name uh he's a little suspicious of what's going on here but nonetheless uh bill woos eliza and they are married shortly thereafter they get married they settle down you know bill builds a house shack like literally people like built their houses back then uh a little, little ways down the road uh and they move in and the house you know it's a, it's a nice house so they, you know bill's like well we need a housekeeper here uh, and I, I've got this old, you know, friend Nancy. Uh, why don't we? Why don't we have Nancy move in with us and be our housekeeper? Well, it turns out Nancy was his girlfriend. <laughs> yeah. Oh, this old friend. You know, she could help with the kids. How? You know, the housekeeping. They didn't even have kids yet. But. <sighs> well, not yet. But again, miraculously, I don't know how. Both Eliza and Nancy start having kids in well, this you know. house. Uh, you know, you know, what are the odds? All right, so we're 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 painting the picture here. Like you've got this unbelievable swirling concoction of well-to-do, religious, by the book, mom side of the family, yep. dad side of the family, uh, not quite as uh, upstanding of a, of a human being, uh, perhaps uh, always seeing all the angles, that yeah. type of thing. But here they mix, and one July evening, all of these forces swirl together. And July 8th, 1839, Eliza gives birth to her second child in the house. In the house, They name him. It's the first son. They decide to name this child after Eliza's father, who was John Davison. They named the boy John Davison Rockefeller. <laughs> uh, and oh boy, does little JD have a lot of both John Davison and Wild Bill <laughs> Rockefeller in him. So on the Rockefeller side, uh, little John is like, he's like totally captivated by his dad. By by the way, Bill doesn't stop, you know, going off to test. He's gone for months at a time. Uh, When he comes back, John like totally dotes on him. He thinks he's the best. He he would, he would even for like the rest of his life, Rockefeller would like intensely defend his father. Chernow would write that in no area did Bill impress his eldest son more or did his eldest son prove more impressionable than in the magical realm of money? Big Bill had an almost sensual love of cash and enjoyed flashing plump rolls of bills. And indeed, one of Bill's companions at the time would say of him, quote, the old man had a passion for money that amounted almost to a craze. I never met a man who had such a love of money. 
except yeah. of course for his son in the future. <laughs> <laughs> and this is where we start to get into the ways in which his son would become like him, but different. And the the like him is, of course, in this love for making as much money as possible. The way in which it is different, you know, Bill would come back from these trips and he would have a fat wad of cash and he would take the $100 bill and he would put it on the outside. He'd make sure that everybody knew that there was at least one, maybe lots of hundreds in this fat wad of cash. Whereas John D would grow up and detest shows of wealth. I mean, the smallest house on the nicest street in Cleveland, and never ever even boarding a friend's yacht because, ugh, you know, that your ostentatiousness offends me and my sensibilities. And so it, it's just interesting to see, I'm going to keep being that person on, on, on the show who's like interjecting ways in which he mixes his mother's side of the family into these lessons from his father. Oh, totally. Well, so speaking of, you know, his mother... We said a minute ago that the Davisons were Baptists, and that was pretty, um, well, not unique, but um, pretty different than some of the original Protestant groups that had come to America, you know, a generation or two before the Baptists, you know, like, think about it, you know, if you're American or know anything about American history, you think Baptists, you think like church revivals, you think like big, showy, you know, theatrical uh the whole point was to evangelize and to recruit. They didn't think that they were like the chosen people that were going off to the new land to be by themselves. They're like, no, no, we're going to take over the world here. We want everybody on our side. Right. It it was an evangelical religion, which uh, bodes really well for a religion growing and prospering and continuing when you can, you know, have a, a, a mandate to keep bringing more people into the fold. Totally. So here's where, (laughs) <laughs> these these two sides of John's you know uh, maternal and, and and paternal sides here seem like oil and water, <laughs> oil and water. <laughs> uh, oh, David, they're not. The Baptists are all about the money. They think money is also great. They just think it's great for a different reason, which is that the more money, the more influence, the more you know followers we can recruit into the fold, and this also has a huge impact on on JD. He would say later, quote, I believe the power to make money is a gift from God, just as are the instincts for art, music, and literature to be developed and used to the best of our ability for the good of mankind. Having been endowed with the gift I possess, <laughs> the gift to make money, I believe it is my duty to make money and still more money and to use the money I make for the good of my fellow man. <laughs> Boom. I mean, Duty. He heard the word duty in there about making money that God has asked him to go forth and make as much money as humanly possible. It it is this incredibly unique thing about John D. Rockefeller where uh, when you describe him as one of the wealthiest businessmen of all time and a philanthropist, it's very different than the way that you would describe today's billionaires as wealthy people. And it's not one, then the other. It's not career and then philanthropy. Like John D. held these things to be intertwined, that he should go make as much money as possible to give no penny away in any deal, in any business dealing, to always get as much as he could, and to be simultaneously incredibly philanthropic. And the 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 purpose of making this money was to be philanthropic, as if he were a better charitable allocator than anybody, you know, walking away from any deal that, that, uh, you know, he was a part of with any bit of edge. Totally. I mean, we're going <laughs> to, we'll get much more into this as we go, but like <laughs> in every dimension, wealth, power, control, philanthropy, impact, <laughs> John D makes like, you know, uh, Bill Gates or Mark Zuckerberg look like just children. <laughs> like it's, uh, it's wild. Uh, so all this, you know, this upbringing, this sort of, you know, milieu that, uh, he's growing up in, uh, in New York in 1853, when John is 14 and sort of, you know, a teenager, sort of just on the cusp of manhood, uh, Bill swoops in, comes back from one of his trips and decides, announces that he is going to move the family away from New York to Ohio, <laughs> specifically to Strongville, which Ben, as you know, is right next to Cleveland. For sure. Strongsville, Ohio. It's uh, one of many wonderful suburbs of the Cleveland area. Yeah. Uh, Cleveland boy. This is like 
This is like your homecoming this episode. It's true. Like a lot of this episode takes place in places that were within like a half hour drive of where I grew up. Oh, so great. So the stated reason for, you know, the move is that Bill wants to you know, go open new territories for uh, for his business. But there's actually another reason, which is uh, <laughs> he's got another new girlfriend back in New York named Margaret, uh, and he wants to keep the families more separate. Oh, boy. Uh, so when they get to Ohio... When- Wait, so I'm sorry. He got another family in New York, and he's trying to create distance. So there's children with three different wives, and he's trying to... Yeah. He's not well, moving to Ohio to get closer to another family. He's moving to Ohio to get more distance. More distance uh, between huh. his two. Well, he kind of has, I don't know exactly how this works out, but so Nancy, the girlfriend, he never married her. He had kids with her. He never married her. Uh, he only married Eliza, but he wants to marry this new girlfriend. And he's kind of thinking, he's like, I mean, this is the world that America was back then. He's like, well, if I just get, you know, like a state border between the two of them, great. I don't see why I can't have. It's true. There's no internet. State registries are probably pretty hard to, you know, go look something up in a different state. Wow. Uh, So they show they move to Ohio. uh, And at first, before Bill marries his second wife, concurrently, Margaret, um, he sends uh, he sends John and his little brother, William, to a boarding house in Cleveland to go to like a real high school in, in, in Cleveland. Um. And that, that goes on for about uh, two years. And then when, when Bill actually marries uh, Margaret, he sends a note, to he sends a letter to John and says, ah, you know, this uh, schooling thing and the well, 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 plans have changed and I, I can't really pay anymore for you and William to go to school. So you, I'm basically deputizing you now as head of household uh, and uh, you're going to have to drop out and get a job and find a way to support the family. Best of luck, son. <laughs> Talking about a wild thing to just hear and totally hijack your life plans. Totally. Uh, and, and this this really was not what John was planning, but um, he does drop out of school and he decides, remember, he's got this this love of money. He's like, whoa, whoa what, what can I do um, to make money? Well, what if I sort of stay close to the money? Uh, so he goes, he pays $40 and does a three-month crash course over the summer in bookkeeping <laughs> and decides that he's gonna become a bookkeeper and this is gonna be his his path to supporting the family ever the sensible fellow uh when he finishes his his training and he, he's off to go get a job he decides that the way he's gonna job search is he gets a directory of all the businesses in cleveland and he looks up what their credit ratings are and decides that he's only gonna target the ones with the best credit ratings <laughs> he's smart i mean to the extent that he thinks that the the access to capital is the thing that you know he wants to be close to you may as well only be a part of businesses with the best access to capital uh, strength leads to strength right <laughs> so uh the story goes that he pounds the pavement for six weeks he goes to every firm on his list they all reject him but he's undeterred uh, and he he just starts back up at the top so he goes to see all these companies like at least two some of them three times Finally, one company, uh, the partnership of Hewitt and Tuttle, uh, two partners, Hewitt was the senior partner and Tuttle was the junior partner. They probably just get so tired of this little kid, the 16 year old kid banging on their door that they're like, all right, fine, <laughs> you, you, you can start, you can, you can work here, you can be a junior <laughs> bookkeeper. This happens on September 26th, 1855. I get this for the rest of of Rockefeller's like 80 plus year life. He celebrates September 26th as his job day. <laughs> I love this. Like more sacred than the birthday. Job day was the day. It's like the day he was, you know, baptized into capitalism by being able to make money in the world. Absolutely. Uh and literally it's like it's like this is the big deal every year in his life. Like it's bigger than the birthday. It's job day, <laughs> uh, except he's you know he's starting in labor, not in capital. But but he he makes the transition pretty quick. Don't worry. So he gets to work. Uh, he becomes basically like the best bookkeeper uh, that history had seen before or since, uh, at least until Pilot. And um, <laughs> he, uh, Chernow writes about 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 this. John betrayed a special affinity for accounting and an almost mystic faith in numbers, 
For Rockefeller, ledgers were sacred books that guided decisions and saved one from fallible emotion. Uh, well, of course they're sacred. Like the the numbers in the books are money. <laughs> and it's the divine, you know, God given path to be close to the money and get as much of it as possible. Uh, yeah, I mean, a- absent the divinity, this is very Buffett esque. I mean, at a young age, having this sort of respect and obsession with the numbers. It's it's wild how uh, I, I didn't talk about this earlier, but they're actually supposedly also when John was a younger kid. He would also like go to the general store and and buy like a a big block of candy and cut it up into little pieces and then sell the little pieces around to to other kids. Yeah, just like uh, Buffett and uh, gum, right? Yep. Sticks of gum. Yep. (laughs) Uh, So so he goes to work uh, uh, in this firm. Now, now what uh, what is Hewitt and Tuttle? They are a merchant trading firm that specializes in produce commodities so think like you know like foodstuffs like things that people would eat you know meat uh, vegetables produce stuff that's coming off of the farms that you know is in the rural areas that we were just talking about going into cities like cleveland i assume they mostly dealt in stuff that foodstuffs that came into cleveland to then be you know sold in stores and consumed by the new newly rising urban populace Right. Or, or Lake Erie. I mean, Lake Erie was a unbelievable sort of means of transport. All the Great Lakes moving stuff around from Canada, the other Great Lakes states coming in the St. Lawrence Seaway from the Atlantic Ocean. Just a lot moved by boat then. Totally, totally. So um, uh, John D is you know rising quickly to the ranks. Uh, pretty much immediately, they give him a 50% raise because he's doing so well, even as a little kid. Uh, in 18... 18- 50, the uh, beginning of 1857, uh, so not quite two years after uh, John joins the firm, Tuttle, the junior partner, leaves to, uh, to go seek his own you know, fortunes uh, out from uh, the under the thumb of the senior partner, Hewitt. And Hewitt's like, all right, well, John, you're, you're, you're my new uh, partner. Not partner, but you know, you're, you're going to take uh, Tuttle's role <laughs> here. Um, John is like, well, that's nice. Are you going to pay me like a partner? <laughs> and uh, uh, he was like, uh, dude, you're like 17 years old. Like, no. <laughs> um, John is undeterred, though. And uh, this is pretty crazy. So, you know, he's like head of household supporting his family. He's already making a lot of money. He's got this great role. Um, but the next year, in 1858, he's like, I, I think I, you know, I'm doing the work of a partner in a merchant trading firm. I'm going to go be a partner in a merchant trading firm. So he hooks up with a much older uh, gentleman named Maurice Clark that he had met doing his accounting, uh, his bookkeeping training. And they go in 50-50 on a new merchant firm called Clark and Rockefeller. And like doing the same thing, still produce and meats and trade and food stuff. Exactly. Food stuffs, produce. Uh, Things go like, okay at first for a couple of years. Like, uh, they what actually, is this like 1859-60? Yeah, 59-60. Uh, they actually, they managed between the two of them to put $4,000 in capital into the firm to start it, to start the trading operations, which like was a lot of money. Uh, and Rockefeller and, and put in half of it. It wasn't Rockefeller like finding ways to borrow from Devil Bill at like yep. kind of, I mean, it was like 10% interest rates and 15%. It was kind of like Devil Bill was kind of figuring out ways to take advantage of his son. Devil Bill definitely had his hands in, uh, had, had his sticky fingers in all this. Uh, that is for sure. Um, so things go like, you know, okay, but they have some losses. They actually have to bring in a third partner, uh, I think in 1860, uh, to sort of shore up some losses and bring more capital into the firm. But then in the next year, in 18. 18- 61. And, and just to put a point on that, the the reason the capital is so important is like they, they basically need to uh, have enough on hand to basically make the purchases and then hold the inventory until they can go and sell it because they're not, you know, the, the, the there's a cash flow cycle there that they need to have enough capital to be able to manage that cash flow cycle. Yep. So, you know, things are going okay. And then 1861, something big happens in America. Something yeah, the, very big. The North goes to war with the South. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Fort Sumter, the Civil War. Uh, 
<laughs> one, Rockefeller doesn't fight in the Civil War, despite being, what would he be, 21, 22 years old at that point in time, like prime fighting age. He hires a substitute. Uh, there, w- there was technically a loophole. He was, as if you were head of family, you didn't have to fight. He was effectively head of his family. He even has a, you know, Rockefeller is very um, careful in how he messages the strife going on in his family. He never throws his dad under the bus. He always holds everyone, at least outwardly, in the highest of esteem. Uh, and so the way that he sort of drops a hint here at some point is he says that, you know, how could I how could I go fight in the war when the business w- would die? It was young, it was fledgling, uh, and, you know, so many relied on it. And that's sort of his him alluding to like, look, like my whole family kind of needs this business to stay alive. Yeah. So... Um, so he doesn't go fight, uh, although he, he was a strict abolitionist and, and that was a big part of the Baptist cause. Um, uh, he doesn't go fight, uh, <laughs> but for his business that, you know, he needs to survive. The war is a pretty big boon for commodity prices, specifically foodstuff prices. I mean, you got to supply an army with food somehow. Uh, yeah, there are a lot more orders in demand for, you know, pork belly and the like coming in thanks to the war. So this drives up the price of foodstuffs uh, through the roof. In 1862, the first like full year of the war, <laughs> the firm Clark and, and Rockefeller, they make a profit, a trading profit of $17,000, which I believe was four times all the money that they had made in all the previous years of operations of the firm. So wow. like they are living large like they're swimming in profits they literally don't like they can't buy enough uh a, enough goods to trade enough enough produce to uh foodstuffs to trade and make more money they got to put this money somewhere <laughs> so what do they do well right around this time people in cleveland are starting to hear about an interesting development that's happening not too too far away in western Pennsylvania, in a tiny little hamlet called Titusville in Western Pennsylvania. And maybe I bet some Ben's obviously smiling here. Uh, some well, of yeah, you I are just maybe did smiling. A zillion hours of. <laughs> 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 but probably most of you are like, uh, what are you talking about here? Like Titusville, Pennsylvania? Like, I, I have no idea where you're going with this. It, everyone knows, David, that the center of the oil world is not the middle east or russia or alaska or texas texas yeah. but western pennsylvania western pennsylvania that's right so i had no freaking clue until reading titan doing the research for this episode for like decades the entire like the center of the oil industry in the world was this small little town yeah, for like 50 years for like 50 like literally i mean there were some producers some oil oil mines uh oil rigs uh, elsewhere but like very small like most of the oil in the world came from titusville pennsylvania and, and we should and not just titusville but other you know uh, oil creek and other areas yeah. of western pa that had had oil discovers so this is all going on it's not that far away from from cleveland uh for the first couple years of this going on up until the civil war the whole industry is just based there in Titusville. They, they drill for the oil. The oil comes out of the ground. They refine the oil. They make kerosene. Which is when, when we say they were refining, like it was a pretty uh, rough process. I mean, they, they were, I think pretty early they figured out you could use sulfuric acid to refine and separate the kerosene out. But like a crap ton of sulfuric acid and like doing this in like large wooden boxes with cracks in it everywhere and it's just sloshing around and spilling all over the ground like it is a gnarly process of quote-unquote refining yeah super super gnarly but right as as rockefeller and clark have all this money that they need to have something to do with people come up with the idea like so the with the oil they were refining it into kerosene kerosene the main use was to burn in lamps uh and w- like, where do you need lamps and artificial light more than anywhere else? You need it in cities. Uh, people realize you don't actually have to refine the oil in the same place that you drill for the oil. <laughs> so all of a sudden now, people are like, wait, wait, 
we can buy the oil that comes out of the ground, crude oil from Titusville, bring it into our cities, refine it in the cities and then sell it, sell the kerosene in the city for and like, that's like a really good business. That's a good place to park some capital. Totally. And like at the same time, all these interesting tailwinds are happening where cities are blowing up. I mean, you have this sort of like uh, industrial revolution that's happening where people don't just live in in the uh, uh, rural areas and farm anymore. There's starting to be a lot more industry in cities. You have for a while, only rich people could basically get oil to to you know, burn at night. Most people would just, the sun would go down and then they'd have no light and they'd go to bed. But like whale oil. And then they oil, would use whale oil, yeah, for right. the whaling industry. Which I think if you, isn't that uh, in the, where Hathaway of Berkshire yes, Hathaway Yes, that's where Hathaway of Berkshire Hathaway came from, from the, originally the from whaling the whaling industry. industry. But well, kerosene's like way cheaper than whale oil, which had a massive shortage. And it's obviously terrible that we kill whales to harvest the whale oil like way cheaper way more plentiful it's a pretty clean thing to burn relative to the other stuff that people were trying to burn so unlikely you'll like die of fumes in your house uh so this is huge you know and the keyword you said you know it's it's cheaper of course (laughs) easier to drill into the ground than go like harpoon a whale and you know all that it's really bad to drill in the ground too. People aren't thinking that at the point in t- this point in time. Yeah, this is an infinite resource here. Yeah, totally. Um, but the plentiful is the key word. So like you said, it was only rich people that used whaling oil that they could have light at night. But the new demand, like with the civil war going on, the war and then, and then industrialization afterwards, you need light for commerce for like industry like it's not just so that rich people can have light you need to like operate factories and like do all this stuff you need light so there's a lot of demand um and kerosene is the answer (laughs) so rockefeller's like oh okay okay, cool like this is a new commodity uh they start trading a little bit in this uh, uh clark and rockefeller um, they start making some profits. But of course, R- Rockefeller is feeling a little hesitant to do too much of it because he's like, ah, this is speculative. Like, who knows when this will dry up? And, you know, there's already been some like boom bust cycles in this. Like foodstuffs are kind of our thing. So, you know, I don't want to dabble too much in this speculative weird oil thing. We don't want to dabble too much into that. And, and and I think initially they were trading crude. Um but then, like I said, people start to realize, wait a minute, we can we can refine in the cities. And this is like really like early knowledge. This is like uh, this would be like in, uh, I don't know, 2011. If somebody came to you and were like, hey, there's buy this Bitcoin. thing called Bitcoin. <laughs> <laughs> and now don't just buy it. But like, I know how to set up rigs to mine it, you know, and like, wait, why don't we just take some old computers you have and like mm. mine it? Uh so this is like really hard to get knowledge. And it just so happens that the one guy in Cleveland, a guy named Samuel Andrews, who knows how to refine oil, is buds with Rockefeller's partner, Clark. <laughs> well, that works out. He's like a yeah. chemist, right? He's a, he's a chemist. Yeah. Well, I mean, chemist <laughs> in quotes well, here. Well, but there's like real science involved in like applying the sulfuric acid and, you yeah. know, no, like you know, separating the kerosene from the g- gasoline and other crap that's left over that you don't have anything to do with. <laughs> Which, by the way, they just pour that stuff into the river. <laughs> oh, totally. In fact, this is a fun little Cleveland trivia. There's a, uh, so everyone knows like the, or a lot of people know the Cuyahoga River caught fire many times. There's this great um, uh, Great Lakes Brewing Company beer called Burning River Ale. Or something, and, and this like, is where it comes from. Totally, because under the cover of night, these refineries would like have all this extra gasoline left over. Cars wouldn't be a thing for 30, 40 more years. They thought the gasoline was like useless, Worthless, and they would just yeah. like drip it into the river. Yeah. Oh, awful. God, just wild, just wild. So Andrews, the chemist who knows how to how to refine kerosene, uh, he's buds with Clark. He goes to Clark one day in the office, in the you know, with the 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 merchant office that they have, and uh, he asks him. He's like, "Hey, I think it'd be a pretty good investment. Uh, I know how to do this. Nobody else around here really knows how to do this. I think it'd be a good investment. Why don't you invest in me, and we'll set up a refinery, and we'll start refining here in Cleveland." So the story goes that uh, <laughs> Clark is like, "Look, man, like we're buds, but like I'm not, I'm not too interested in this. Like we're really." 
ah, we, we really just don't have the cash. Like, I wish I could, but we don't have the cash. But Rockefeller overhears what's going on and he pipes in and he's like, hey, actually, I think that's 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 not a bad idea. I'm interested in that. <laughs> uh, and Clark, of course, knows that, you know, Rockefeller is really good at this stuff. And he's like, OK, uh, fine. They turn around, they invest four thousand dollars on the spot to go set up a new refinery. <laughs> wow. And clear, which is a lot of money. That's the same amount of money that they started the firm with, uh, but they've got all this cash now. So later that year, they open the Excelsior Works Refinery in a strategically chosen spot in town. Ben, you'll probably know exactly where this is. In the flats, right? Uh, yeah, I think in the flats. It's uh, an area that has access both to the Cuyahoga River and to the terminus of new rail lines that are going into Cleveland. Yeah, and like super industrial area. Actually, in the last few years, there's been like an amazing amount of re- renovation and like cool stuff that's going on there. So you have this like interesting confluence of the river and like everything left over from the standard standard oil days and like the steel boom that happened in Cleveland and now this redevelopment. But yeah, it's totally the the city area that's up against the waterfront. Huh. Interesting. We'll have to go do uh do a field trip there for sure. We'll, we'll do a Trova trip. <laughs> okay, so. Rockefeller, this is like, he is like a pig in mud here. I mean, like he was a bookkeeper. He's so meticulous. He loves money. He loves profit. He was focused on trading before, but now he's got this operation, this refinery. And he becomes like, literally, he's like the Morris Chang of oil refineries. Like (laughs) he's experimenting with constantly tweaking the process. You know, Andrews, the, the chemist is like, Dude, I'm like the technical talent, but Rockefeller's like everything around it, the operations, how crude comes in, how they refine, like where things are located in the factory. He's A-B testing, like he's doing oh, wow. all sorts of stuff. He's always looking like any efficiency and it's all with a view to it. It's not just like, like better is good, but it's all with a view to like profit, like profitability. Like we want to run this as lean as possible, make as much God money. told me to make a profit and I am here to make a profit. By the way, put a pin in that Morris Chang thing because there's an interesting way that they are very much like TSMC that I want to talk about later. Ooh, ooh, let's come back. So, you know, he's focused like this is so different. You know, there are other people that are setting up refineries in Cleveland and elsewhere, but they're just like they're just picking up hundred dollar bills off the ground. Like they don't care about optimization. They don't care about like uh, you know efficiency. They're just like, look, hey, it's it's a gold rush. Like we're just like, you know, like give me the gold, and I'll just take as much of it as possible. If it goes away tomorrow, that's fine. Yep, I mean, it's high margin dollars just flying out of the ground. It's a Rockefeller though. Like he's, uh, you know, all all of this, the behavior of the other folks, this causes huge gyrations in price. Like it really is. It's like the early days of Bitcoin. I mean, or still today in crypto, like things are flying around like all the time. Like prices could be. You know, twelve dollars a barrel. They could be twelve cents a barrel for oil, and it all depends on. I mean, two things. One is who found what, and two is what do people believe people have found recently. And so, like, prices would be impacted by word of mouth traveling and saying, "Hey, I heard there's a big gusher going on in this city right now," and people would be like, "Well, I guess I'm not going to buy for a while because I heard there's a big gusher, and so prices are going to go down." Yep. So Rockefeller, though, like he's he's just got this vision where he's like. Oh man, the more profit I make, the more money, the more capital I can put into this, the more oil I can hold, the more I can produce. And when the price crashes, I'll just keep buying. Like, I'll just keep it. He's like, he buys the dip like over and over (laughs) and over again. Uh, And because his operations are so much more efficient and so much more profitable, he can, he can afford to pay like, more than anybody else he can afford to hold this stuff longer he's like really thinking long term in a way that none of his other competitors are oh and we should say like when we say he's tweaking stuff he's so so much more profitable he is both horizontally and vertically integrating so like let's talk about vertically integrating first he's doing things like realizing geez, we're hiring a lot of like plumbers to come in and oh, this like, is so good. I love this. Lay this pipe every time we do a build out. And so they do things like 
hire their own plumber and hire their own blacksmiths and decide, actually, we should do this ourselves. And that way we can save all this money on piping instead of buying it from a third party contractor. Later down the road, he even plants a forest, like buys up a forest so that they can uh, cut down the trees themselves to build the barrels out of their own barrels. Yeah. And they save all this this money rather than buying barrels from somebody else. And then, of course, they can innovate on the barrel making process. So he figures out, oh, if we treat the wood in the forest, then it's lighter and cheaper to ship back to the refinery. So we save all this money on transportation. So that's like the vertical integration side of things, which would be crazy enough. But he's also horizontally integrating. He's figuring out that, wait, we do this process how else can we how can we sort of use the whole buffalo like yes. what can we sell the gasoline for what i think they invent vaseline yes they, they i think they buy the company that invents vaseline but yeah they like like petroleum jelly which is one of the byproducts they commercialize it right they figure out how to use every little piece of everything that they're doing to go you know there's a new market invented for every little byproduct of the standard oil production process it's so great so uh Rockefeller is like, I mean, he, he, he's, he's like found his calling here. Like this is like divine, like, uh, uh, passion here. <laughs> There's just one problem, which is the partner Clark. Clark is like not so into how much capital, <laughs> uh, Rockefeller is tying up in the business here. He's like, uh, Hey, we're like merchant traders. The point is profits. And then we keep the profits and Rockefeller's like, no, like reinvest in R&D and like CapEx and, uh, and inventory. Um, <laughs> so uh, <laughs> Rockefeller starts going around to all the banks and all the financers in Cleveland and lining up. He's just not, not even using just the profits from their operations. He's getting more external financing to finance growth here. Oh, totally. Like when I when I say both vertically and horizontally integrating, like in the horizontal sense, he is obsessed with trying to figure out how to be the sole supplier of oil to the world. Like as soon as he figures out that there's economies of scale here, he's like, okay, cool. How do we like start the flywheel, get as much capital as possible, build out as much production as possible, start having agreements with whoever's got rights to the land as possible so we can start vending to the world. Yep. And own this super strategic choke point of refining in cities. So uh, Clark is like spooked by all this. Uh, Chernow has this amazing quote that he finds from Rockefeller. I don't know where he found this. This uh, I should look up in the in the notes at the at the end of Titan. This is so good. <laughs> Rockefeller apparently like wrote or said this at some point. Clark was an old grandmother and was scared to death because we owed money to the banks. <laughs> oh, so great. So <laughs> Rockefeller engineers a coup. This is so good. Like and and Clark's some of Clark's brothers are also partners in the business at this point in time. They get into all these arguments. So <laughs> John baits them one day into threatening that uh, that they should just dissolve the partnership. And John's like, okay, great. <laughs> Let's dissolve the partnership. Well, because he knows that if, if he goes to them and says, look, I don't think you guys, first of all, I don't think you are risk tolerant enough. Second of all, I don't think you're upstanding. Like, I don't think you're men of God the way that I am. And therefore, I don't think you're worthy business partners because I think you're going to be a risk to the business. Uh And so I want out like he knows that he loses leverage by doing that. So that's why he baits them into, you know, doing their normal thing of getting all up in a fit and saying, we're going to back out. Yep, totally. So he (laughs) Rockefeller immediately goes to the local paper uh, and places a notice that the partnership is dissolving and that there's going to be an auction for uh, the assets of the partnership, including the oil refineries. And it sets up this showdown where the Clark brothers and Rockefeller bid against each other for each other's 50% uh, stake in the business. Which is, by the way, a great way to do it. Like if you've got a partnership that's blowing up, like, all right, whoever wants to pay more to buy the other person out is the person that should get to own the whole thing. And so the the idea of a bidding war between the two of them to figure out to, ha- to figure out how to ba- value the business makes total sense between the two principles. Uh, so Rockefeller, though, remember he's got he's been going and getting the relationships with all the banks and financiers. He lines up financing in advance <laughs> of the auction, so he's got basically unlimited 
resources, although it's still the price ends up stressing him out. He buys Clark's 50% of the oil business for $72,500. And in exchange also gives Clark Rockefeller's gives gives Clark his 50% share of the produce trading. Which by the way, that that's something he probably buys him out for like three to four million dollars, something like that in 2021 dollars. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, a good good chunk of change. Yeah. But that 50%, that $72,500 or, you know, however you want to think about it. <laughs> that's 50% of Standard Oil right there. Wow. Uh, Rockefeller would say later, it was the day that determined my career. Probably bigger than job day. <laughs> I felt the bigness of it, but I was as calm as I am talking to you now. This is, he's talking to his biographer later. He's just like, this is like what we're going to see. Like this man has ice not ice water like literally like solid ice running through his veins (laughs) it's crazy so so this was a big price Uh, it was more than rockefeller wanted to pay but this happens in 1865 in the beginning of in february of 1865 (laughs) back to what's going on in america two months later general lee surrenders to grant and the civil war is over and with the civil war over what's less important commodity produce trading Mm. and what is all of a sudden a hell of a lot more important oil industry urbanization everything well because all these soldiers are coming back and getting jobs in factories like you have sort of an industrial boom here and it's interesting how rockefeller is sort of obsessed with i'm not a speculator you know, I'm not one of these people rushing to prospect, you know, various plots of land in Western Pennsylvania. We are, you know, it's funny that it's, uh, I would say a picks and shovels play, but actually this predates the gold rush by 50 years. So it's, it's pre picks and shovels. Well, it depends which gold rush I think you're talking. The California Fair. gold rush was even a little earlier, but like, yeah, we go on for a long time. I don't know when Levi's was started. That would be another good one to do someday. Totally. I guess the point to make here is he's doing the predictable, reliable, stable, very strategic part of the value chain. He's not out prospecting land. Yeah. Well, and the, you know, to just doubly underscore strategic, like this, you know, I don't know. It did, did Rockefeller know the war was going to end in two months? I mean, probably. I think Sherman's probably marching to the sea at, at this point. Um, uh, but, uh, But yeah, just being able to see after the war how important this is. So Chernow writes, quote, the war had stimulated growth in the use of kerosene by cutting off the supply of southern turpentine, which had yielded a rival illuminant called camphene. The war had also disrupted the whaling industry and led to a doubling of whale oil prices. Moving into the vacuum, kerosene emerged as an economic staple and was primed for a furious post-war boom. This burning fluid extended the day in cities and removed much of the lonely darkness from rural life. Soon, John D. Rockefeller would reign as the undisputed king of that world. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, So he's now got the oil operations, the refining business all to himself. December of 1865, the war is over. All this is going on. He opens a second refinery in Cleveland next to the Excelsior works the new name that he really he, he chooses he wants to he wants to let everybody know that his oil his kerosene his business his operations is going to be bigger than anyone else it's going to be the best quality there's not going to be any low quality kerosene coming out of this and it is going to rain from sea to sea what does he call the new operation Standard Oil. <laughs> well, the uh, first, it's the factory is, is Standard Works, the Standard Works, and then it becomes. Oh, really? Yeah. Uh, so ex- the first one, was, the first refinery was the Excelsior Works, and then uh... the Standard Works is the name that he chooses. The Standard. He is setting the standard. And importantly, yeah, it's about setting industry standards. I mean, for him, he was observing. I know I'm hammering home on this, like speculators and cowboys thing, but like especially after the war, you've got all these soldiers who are trying to figure out what to do with their lives, and they're going and they're you know working and and drilling. And so you have all these people that have, I think in the book it refers to someone with a, a gun and a canteen and and uh, you know their plot of land in Pennsylvania and. 
like I think Rockefeller is basically observing that the kerosene that could power the world is uh volatile in price. People are scared that it's not safe because it's being refined in questionable ways. And so people's houses are burning down. You have, you know, like there's not professionalization in the kerosene industry the way that he wants to bring it. So this this notion of standard is almost like kind of like the TSMC chip yield thing. Like everything yeah. that comes oh, off of I our line it. is super high quality. It's it's totally that is that is exactly the same analogy like this is not necessarily easy stuff to do you can do it cheaply and poorly um but they're going to set the standard so and by the way at this point he's now figured out that he can run the factory on gasoline so the standard oil factories are burning less coal than their competitors (laughs) and using the gasoline byproduct oh that's so great so they're literally feeding themselves yep ah so you said something a minute ago when you're talking about this you said selling this oil this kerosene to the world. So by the very next year in 1866, <laughs> you know, America is a big market and is going to grow hugely, especially after the civil war. But do you know what's a bigger market? The rest of the world, <laughs> <laughs> especially at this point in time. I mean, America is not America yet. It's, I, I don't know how many hundreds, a few hundred million people tops. Oh no, no. Well, it's 300 million people now. So or three, Three, oh, sorry. I meant the global population is a, is oh. a few hundred million. So, oh, that's a good question. I don't know what the global population is around then, but yeah, I mean, Amer- America is probably 30, 40 million people. Yeah, maybe if that. Um, All right, you, you keep talking. I'm going to Google this. Okay. Okay. Great. Well, so by the very next year in 1866, the fledgling standard oil company is already selling two thirds of their kerosene overseas, primarily to Europe. So like one third domestic, two third, two thirds international already. 31 million people in 1865. Wow. God, that's so crazy to think about America having 31 million people. Uh, So they're selling all this, um, they're selling most of their, their, you know, oil overseas. Uh, he sends, he, he dispatches, Rockefeller dispatches his little brother, William, who's now working in the business, to New York City to go handle all of the export business for Standard Oil. Do you know the story about when he went to New York City and needed to raise, I think it was $50,000? Ooh, I don't know. Oh, yeah. Well, it's a great story. So uh, this is in Chernow's book. Rockefeller has a bit of his father in him, uh, sort of a flair for showmanship. And um, he really needs $15,000. Like he needs a loan pretty quickly. And he's sort of looking around for financiers for it. And, um, you know, he he dresses very nicely and he presents himself nicely and he walks in areas where he's sure to bump into people. And at some point, someone stops his carriage and looks over and says, Oh, Mr. Rockefeller, could you could you use a fifty thousand dollar loan? <laughs> and of course, Rockefeller is like jackpot, and he sort of looks at him like without breaking, and he looks at him. He goes, "Hmm, could you give me twenty four hours to think it over?" Yeah, uh. and of course, by doing that, he gets like the best terms on the loan. It's like, but I'm he's not sure so, I really need this. He's unbelievable at like getting his hands on way more capital at way better terms than other oh. people would be able to. Oh, so good. So good. That, uh, oh, that story is so good. I think that one that happened back in Cleveland, right? Was that in Cleveland? I think, I think that one was in Cleveland. Yep. Yep. But, okay. uh, uh, but now that, now that they're, now that William's in New York and the family's got <laughs> the family, uh, <laughs> has got operations in New York, they can get like, you know, 50, like, Oh, Mr. Mr. Ro- Sir Rockefeller's could you use $250,000 or $500,000? So pretty soon they're like bringing a bazooka to a, like a fist fight with, with the other refiners out there. And it's kind of like uh, this whole, this whole like part of the story just reminded me so much of like the Uber days. You know, remember when Uber went out and raised all that money and totally. it was like, Oh, we're going to flatten Lyft and, uh, and DD and all the global competitors that like, ah, uh, it was totally, it was the Uber playbook, except like it really worked. <laughs> yep. Speaking of Uber, <laughs> right after uh, William goes to New York, these sort of um, 
shall we say, Emil Michael character of uh, uh, <laughs> of Standard You're stretching Oil. Stretching a metaphor here. I'm stretching. All right, I'm stretching it too far. But <laughs> uh, an interesting, uh, colorful character comes into the fold in the fledgling Standard Oil empire. I uh, <laughs> I've been posting on Twitter like all the fun stuff, like just because I've been enjoying this research so much, and I posted about this guy. Henry Morrison Flagler on uh, on Twitter and uh, Andy Sparks replied to my tweet with I think like the best the best one liner about Flagler possible. He says, "quote Flagler was a savage." <laughs> 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 oh, and he was really like he was like you know Rockefeller. He's driven by this divine calling. He's willing to go to the mat. He's willing to do just about whatever. But it was Flagler and then some of the other lieutenants that he brought in that were like, they're the ones who did the dirty work. (laughs) Oh, yeah, because Rockefeller needed to, you know, he needed to preserve plausible deniability left, right and center, especially once he figured once they figured out all the business tactics that were really going to let them press their advantage. You know, he had some he had some very bad lieutenants so he could stay as uh, plausibly good as possible. Although he would, Rockefeller was for sure the one pulling the, <laughs> pulling the strings. So Flagler ends up coming into the business, or coming into the business because um, he has a wealthy relative uh, named Stephen Harkness who hears about what's going on and, and wants to invest like equity dollars into this new standard operation. Uh, so he invests a hundred thousand dollars in in the operation, which oh my goodness, like I I, I didn't actually find like what the you know sort of net worth of the harkness family ends up being because of this but like enormous yeah it has to be just generational wealth and his his sort of one term that he asked for as part of investing is that he wants i think maybe flagler was his nephew or something he wants flagler to join the firm as treasurer to quote keep an eye on his investment (laughs) (laughs) and so flagler joins and literally this is what i tweeted (laughs) he keeps a quote on his desk at standard oil for all the time he's working there. The quote says, do unto others as they would do unto you and do it first. (laughs) (laughs) Oh my goodness. So Flagler takes over the negotiations for shipping of oil with the railroads. You can, if you know anything about standard oil, you can see where this is going. Uh, when Rockefeller was running negotiations with the railroads, uh, he always was able to get pretty good rates, uh, shipping rates, because he had a Batna being there in Cleveland on Lake Erie. Totally, it's it, it, during the during the summer months and the spring and fall, we can ship way cheaper by sending it, you know, out by water. By water, yep. So all the the crude coming in from Titusville to be refined in. Uh, in, in in Cleveland at, at Standard uh, could come in over the water or by rail. And then when it was going out to then go off to the rest of the country and the rest of the world, he, he had another option. <laughs> Flagler, he's like, oh, this is nice. That's cute. <laughs> he goes Let's exercise step- our power a different way. Yeah. What about if we go to the railroads and we're like, hey, guys, it's really expensive to operate these railroads. Um <laughs> what what would you say if we were to guarantee a really, really, really large amount of minimum shipments of oil that we'll do with you in exchange for us guaranteeing you guys like an unbelievable amount of volume that we'll do on your railroads, you give us an equally unbelievable rate, <laughs> shipping rate, <laughs> like cost of, of doing this. The railroads are like, uh, yeah, that sounds good. Except that the railroads are like, wait a minute, but you don't make that much oil. You don't make that much money. Yeah. Well, and, and where's all this oil going to come from? <laughs> well, uh, specifically, the railroads think this sounds really good because with the amount of volume that they're talking about, this means they can run dedicated lines of just oil tank cars. So not mixed trains with like box cars and oil cars, like just oil tanks between Titusville and Cleveland with no stops. So if you think about operating a railroad, like, if you have different types of product that you're loading on to, onto the train, that takes more time and money. And they were gonna, they were like being forced to stop to pick up like one car and exactly. add it to the train. And then all these stops that just adds up. You know, it costs money. Right? You know, time is money here. So they, 
they love this. But as you said, Ben, <laughs> they're like, well, how, uh, you know, uh, Henry, like this is, uh, this is a great idea, but how are you going to do it? You don't have enough capacity. And two other things before we answer that question. One is, um, th- just to give like the magnitude of how much this helped them, it, it lets them own way less cars also. Like the railroad, they get to go from something like needing to have 150 cars to being able to like make the same amount of money on like 40 or something just like dramatically smaller. And the other thing is Standard Oil has started to like really build up some credibility here because when people were putting oil on trains before, like they were sloshing around in like open wooden yeah. boxes and like Standard Oil pioneered, you know, hey, we're going to put them in like tanks and then eventually metal tanks and it really like and eventually we're gonna the... make railroad cars that are like the car itself is just a tank yep and fast forwarding a little bit like oh railroads what if we made those tanks for you <laughs> uh but we're getting ahead of ourselves so fly goes like don't worry guys i got this so he goes around to all the other refiners like everybody else in cleveland and he's like hey guys i have negotiated a great <laughs> rate for all of us do y'all want to come on board together and we'll all like pool our you know our our uh shipments that we're all getting in from titusville and uh by doing this all together we've got this great rate <laughs> and he's, he's this is an offer that they can't refuse <laughs> and not, not only can they sort of not refuse it because uh what happens if we say no but like this is their major cost driver like they're in a commodity industry at this point and so transportation is like distribution of the oil is actually the big driver of the business yep yep so okay everybody's like well this is fantastic Flagler's like okay great great let's do this but uh you know one thing like um let's not write any of this down okay <laughs> <laughs> let's just keep this all as a little gentleman's agreement between all of us and the railroads Nobody knew. We don't need any feds, you know, sniffing around here. (laughs) Feds, quote unquote, if there even were any then. Well, basically, if anybody ever asks us if we have an agreement, there's no agreement. Everybody can look at each other and go, I haven't seen an agreement. Yep, totally. So this agreement (laughs) comes to be known as the Lakeshore Agreement uh, because that was the Lakeshore Railroad was the main railroad that they, they did this with. Uh, and this is huge. Uh, so by doing this, until this point in time, Cleveland as a city, so if you f- forget the individual companies of which Standard is one within, within Cleveland, but just think about uh, product- refining, refining production of oil in America. Cleveland was actually the number two largest center for oil refining behind Pittsburgh at this time. Once they do this deal, <laughs> Cleveland is like fast-tracked and becomes number one and standard and rockefeller and flagler they're like they're like the they're like the godfather they, they're like they just brought all the other families in cleveland like to heal like they run you know the collective now and this starts a playbook of like either we if there's oil leaving the city either it's ours or we have some agreement in place where like it's good for us even if it's not actually ours and maybe it'll eventually become ours yep so they dominate Cleveland. Cleveland becomes the number one oil center in uh, uh, production, refining center in America. Um, but, you know, <laughs> that's not enough for young Rockefeller. Uh, he's got his sights set on the whole industry, like Pittsburgh, Philadelphia. The, there is some refining happening in Titusville, some in West Virginia, some in New York. He wants all of it. So how how's he going to do this? as you alluded to at the top of the show, there actually is no legal framework at this point in time for businesses to operate outside their own states. Yeah, they can't. Importantly, uh, they cannot own property in other states. Yeah, they can't. They can't own property. They can't have operations. Um, You know, like literally this, you know, the United States was like, this is all changing after the Civil War, but it was United States. Like the states were the sovereign you know, or near sovereign entities here. Totally. And it's really only recently that you could just sort of incorporate your own business as you please at all without getting express written consent from the government. I mean, in the days of England and and early in the US, like incorporating a 
company, a corporation was like, the government's granting you a special right to operate this business. And so already the doors charter, are literally. Bl blown wide open that you can just start a company, but we're not yet to the era of like, oh, I can start a national corporation. Yep. So they think for a while, this, this whole little crew <laughs> at Standard Oil and, and Cleveland about how they're going to do this. They know that if they want to consolidate the whole industry in the whole country, they need A, a lot of capital, and B, uh, an ability to operate outside the borders of Ohio. So Flagler <laughs> comes up with this idea. And he, this is amazing. He actually like... It's, in, it's financial and corporate law innovation. Innovation. And did you find, did you read about how uh, he comes up with a new structure that they, that they uh, use, or, or uh, I guess it was an old structure, but that they um, wasn't very popular, but they turned to the joint stock company. Did you read about how Flagler, who was not a lawyer, drew up the actual like... <laughs> incorporation oh time. wasn't it on like a like a yellow legal pad yeah like on like the equivalent of a yellow legal pad no like, letterhead yeah totally which partially i think was uh just because that's how like this was still you know wild west type stuff uh but also i think they didn't want anybody to really know about this they wanted this to be super secret so flagler comes up with the ideas like ah oh, these joint stock companies which i mean i think like wasn't the dutch east india company a I think joint so. stock company so he takes this idea uh, but not many other companies were doing it. If we, he says, if we were a joint stock company, then we could buy and we could buy shares in in other joint stock companies. We could also sell shares in ourselves, you know, to raise money or or to strategic partners who we might want to have a vested interest in our success. This is, this is interesting. This might solve some of the you know capital requirements. Um, uh. Okay, well, 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 that's interesting. And also, this like selling shares to raise equity capital thing. Rockefeller is like, my God, that is brilliant. How did I not think of this before? Totally, totally. And the best, like, it's, it's Flagler that comes up with this. It's amazing. So on January tenth, eighteen seventy, they abolish the old partnership, and they pour all of its assets into the new joint stock company, the Standard Oil Company of Ohio. Boom, uh, it's it's born. Uh, but, uh, and, and by assets, they capitalized this new joint stock corporation with $1 million of liquid assets. Like that is how uh, enormous this had become already. Uh, unheard of. I don't think that there was uh, any other organized enterprise in America with that amount of capital, period. Any other wow. industry, like already, that's how big this is. And we're still just getting started. So this doesn't solve the interstate commerce issue though <laughs> so they come up with another absolutely brilliant and diabolical <laughs> plan to solve this which is the trust uh and um what they decide to do is they say well, like okay technically companies can't own shares in co other companies outside the state but what if we create a trust then this trust holds shares in companies all around the country. The trust could have some trustees that sort of get to decide what happens with maybe all the companies that roll up to the trust. We can sort of uh, make sure that these corporations, each of which are ni nicely situated inside their own state and don't own any property outside their own state, but like we, the trustees sort of get to decide how those companies might work together. Yep. And there's no law that says that officers of, you know, any given company can't be trustees of <laughs> of a trust that owns shares in other companies. So this is this is the loophole around it. So they create this trust and the trustees just uh A dictate to the other companies that they purchase what to do, but also B, this is important. All the dividends from all the other companies, the trustees designate the beneficiaries as the individual shareholders of Standard Oil of Ohio. So nothing ever touches the actual company, Standard Oil of Ohio. It all goes to the trustees oh. and then to the individual shareholders. And that's how they get around this. Interesting. So even the so the the standard the individuals who own the corporation. Yep, literally everybody on the cap table. <laughs> ha, end up being the sort of 
you know, puppeteer, controller, and beneficiaries of all these other entities. So Rockefeller comes up with the idea. He's like, oh, this is amazing. He comes up with the idea that none of them are going to take a salary. They're going to focus solely on these dividends that are coming in as like a, a source of a, 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 a of value and income, but also even more importantly, focus on the appreciation of the value of you know this whole enterprise. Uh, this was like this was new thinking. Like now, people are listening to probably like, uh, yeah, duh. Like, uh, like equity, why else would you join a startup? Why else would you do you know do <laughs> start a company or join a startup? Nobody had ever thought this way before. Like the idea that equity. And, and dividend could like that that could be your primary you know source of income and and wealth generation and that you could use that to incentivize new people who you're bringing into the organization as employees or partners or companies you're buying like yeah the the idea that like your competitors could become your friends by <laughs> being able to offer them ownership in the joint combined company where as we win in this industry and this industry gets bigger, we all win by holding shares of this thing together. Yep. Uh, this is literally, this is the birth of the modern American economic corporation. Uh, <laughs> Chernow writes, whatever the debates about his ethics, economists and historians have unanimously extolled Rockefeller's role as a pioneer of the modern corporation. Uh, and then quoting from uh, another biographer of Rockefeller, Rockefeller must be accepted as the greatest business administrator America has ever produced. <laughs> and it's this. So <laughs> this is how well this works. In the very first year of the trust, uh, 1870, first year of all this getting set up. Remember, there's $1 million in total capital that gets put into this, into this structure. <laughs> they pay a 105% dividend at the end of the year, including also reinvesting tons of cash flow back into the business and, you know, expanding and buying other companies. So like the million dollars that was in there, they pay over a million dollars out to the shareholders and have many other millions of dollars to go do other things. It's crazy. It's like they're, they're extremely profitable and they're growing like crazy. Yeah. And let's talk about this uh, Rockefeller's argument to the societal benefit for a moment, which is like, A, it's silly that the state borders are preventing us. Like, why should that really be a thing? Like, to the extent that I've been able to rapidly expand in Cleveland, and we've been able to create great product for consumers at a low price, like quality of life for people has gotten better. And like, that has all happened because we've expanded here. Why shouldn't we just be able to do that for people everywhere? And his argument is really like, this is for the betterment of consumers. Now, my competitors, when I move into these states, probably don't like it. But like, ultimately, the American public wins. And he's right. <laughs> he's totally right. Uh, just like, uh, you know, Jeff Bezos would probably say the same thing today or with Mark Amazon or, or the like. Well, speaking of today and uh, Facebook and Amazon and great companies, we have a great company that we want to tell you about, our second sponsor of season nine, PitchBook. Well, I'm going to try and figure out how to work a Standard Oil thing in here, David. Uh, do you think Standard Oil is in PitchBook? Probably. I mean, like, <laughs> I can't stop thinking about the fact that they organized this whole structure they paid a 105% dividend the first year. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh man, like if, if PitchBook had data on, it's be like, you know, raising a like massive growth round from SoftBank and then paying out all the money again at the end of the year. Like, <laughs> I want to start seeing this stuff in PitchBook. <laughs> Unprecedented in business history. Well, uh, listeners, as you know, PitchBook has the best, that both the, the widest and the deepest data on private companies um, in the world, I mean, they're they're the leading financial pro data provider for venture capital, for private equity, for all companies looking at M and A. They uh, have 3.1 million companies and over one and a half million deals. So maybe like half of those 3.1 million companies are probably spinoffs of Standard Oil, and uh, actually reconsolidated. You know, maybe maybe a little bit less. But uh, I will tell you that uh, uh, I'm a, a excited and and. Um, 
uh, raving user. 96% of their clients rate PitchBook's coverage of private companies better than any other data provider. And uh, actually, a few people have DM'd me in the, the Slack about this, but we've got a great offer for you. You can explore PitchBook's database firsthand by signing up to get limited access. That's free access to the largest database of private market intel for two whole weeks. So you can sign up at PitchBook dot com slash acquired or click the link in the show notes and see how pitchbook can help you so thank you to our friends over at pitchbook indeed thank you pitchbook so david <laughs> they've now got the structure in place to become a national trust oh, you know, boy. And, and expand here how do they do that what happens Ah, oh, this is so <laughs> so great from just like this story is like I'm so the smile on my face is so juicy. wide right now. Whether it's juicy, yeah, we great great is up for debate. Um, so you know the structure, the joint stock company, they can buy and hold stock in other in other companies. Other company they can issue shares, hold it in them. What are they going to do here? Remember, we said the railroads are the most strategic, important like supplier and choke point for. The industry <laughs> standard goes to the three biggest railroads the pennsylvania railroad the storied huge enormous pennsylvania railroad i think that's New on a monopoly board it is it is literally on a monopoly board <laughs> like that is how <laughs> uh the pennsylvania the new york central and the erie railroads and they say uh so we got this new thing this new thing lets us do things with other <laughs> companies. Do you want to cooperate? Do you want to cooperate? How about we thing? all do something together? <laughs> uh, and the railroads are like, oh yeah, we like doing stuff. This sounds pretty good. So they get together. They set up a shell corporation called the South Improvement Company. Oh, this is so juicy. So here's the deal. With Which the is in intentionally nebulously named. Yes, yes. And in fact, later in life when... Uh, Rockefeller would be getting grilled in in federal depositions. Uh, he would be oh, asked yeah. if he was ever a director or involved in the Southern Improvement Company, and Which, Rockefeller of course, would be like, is "Not a thing. Nope. I have no idea." <laughs> Standard Oil was never involved in the Southern Improvement <laughs> Company. Oh my goodness, so great! Obviously, it, he was not perjuring himself by saying that because the questioner got the name wrong. Though, though, I think he did perjure himself in other. SIC I think, yeah, related. I think he did. Think he did. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so here's the deal. Standard Oil is going to set up and control most of the South Improvement Company through their, through their new you know, trust and joint stock corporation structure. The railroads will own a, a token amount, but the railroads and the principal you know, owners of the railroads, the individuals, they're going to issue some, uh, Standard Oil is going to issue them some stock. So that uh, you know, these guys now have a have a little uh, little skin in the game with uh, with Standard Oil. <laughs> uh, all the interests are aligned here. Well, and the railroads had a problem that they need solved, which was that like because of the boom bust nature of everything that's going on their cars, especially oil, uh, and the sort of remember that thing that I mentioned earlier where people are. Uh, deciding not to buy because they hear it's going to be cheaper soon because they know there's a big gusher. Like this whole thing is like totally screwing with the railroads. Not to mention the fact that with intense competition among the railroads, just like there was intense competition among all of the non sort of standard oil uh, oil companies, like a lot of the profits are just being arbitraged away. And so they've got like unpredictable demand. They've got you know, booms and busts. They've got this situation, especially with oil, where like uh, uh, certain types of oil in certain areas were so insanely cheap that like everybody's going out of business because no one can make any money. The same sort of thing is happening happening in the railroad industry. And so, if there's like a cooperation opportunity for the railroads and you know, Rockefeller's offering them, I can kind of solve your problem here and we can sort of smooth out business. Ben, it really comes down to like, it's really hard to run a business when prices are, are fluctuating and they're not fixed. So clearly <laughs> the answer is to fix the prices. <laughs> oh my goodness. Okay. So uh, we, we ascribe no virtue to this. I think that the, 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 the jury on this whole thing, and then we'll get to this later in the episode and, and certainly in part two of like, 
what parts of this were good and what parts of this were bad. Like it's both there. there yep. There's lots of both that happened all through this story. Yep. Okay. So <laughs> the three, three biggest railroads and standard, they get together in this South improvement company and they say, hey, here's what we're going to do. All the railroads, we're going to, we're going to set a new fixed price. There is now a fixed, literally a fixed price for shipping oil on railroads to everybody out there, all anybody who's shipping oil, there's one single fixed price and it's really high. Like whatever it was before, like it's like a like a multiple of that. It's it's really high. Except for anybody who's a member with us of the South Improvement Company, y'all get a 50% discount <laughs> on that fixed price. And it goes even further. Now, this is just like, oh, just twisting the knife here. Anybody else? Anybody who's a member of of our little uh, our little company here? One might say uh, a little cartel. Little cartel, yeah. <laughs> also, they will receive a uh, a little dividend, a, a, little, a little kickback. They call it technically a drawback from any revenue that anybody, any other oil producers that are not part of this that, that ship on the railroads. Part of that revenue from the really high price that they're charging, they're just going to give some of that revenue to the competitors that are part of this little cabal here (laughs) this is the most mind-blowing part of the deal like not only do you get a rebate for shipping with us so that way the price is actually way cheaper but you also get a rebate even when you're not the shipper i mean they call it this this drawback but like other people ship stuff with us and thank you because you are a nice member of our organization you're gonna get some of that money and so your competitors are are just paying you like it's the craziest system ever i don't know what the formal definition of the crime of racketeering is but this sounds <laughs> like <laughs> whatever it is i think this fits the case well there's a couple different ways that there this story draws parallels to microsoft but this reminds me so much of that cpu licensing thing that they did oh, do you remember yes. this in the early windows I do. days I where do. The, the deal that microsoft cut with i think it was ibm was yeah, uh, you know, you, you guys can um, uh, can use Windows, and uh, that's great. And you can if use you whatever ship operating system you want, any computers that that have a CPU in them that that don't have, you know, that aren't running Windows, you're also going to pay us for those CPUs. And uh, that's the deal they signed. And so Microsoft basically ended up with you know the monopoly, of the entire industry, because IBM's like, well, wait a minute. Whether we're putting Windows on these machines, we're not. We're paying for it. And so yep. I think oh. Windows it is. If and actually, only, I don't know if it was Windows yet. It might have been DOS. If only Gates and uh, Bomber and Jeff Rakes and, and all the like had, had had if they'd had our episodes here on Standard Oil to listen to before they <laughs> put that stuff in writing. Uh, yeah, it, it, history it, it tur- could have been different. It, it, it turns out, yes, th- this may have been a flashpoint once uh, once the, the, the public realized how egregious this sort of agreement say, sounded there is literal rioting in the streets in titusville in in reaction to this once once word gets out like literally like people are like fighting in the streets they're like banging up and destroying you know standard uh uh tanks and property and like i mean it's truly heads i win tails you lose for standard oil versus their competitors yep yep and and the railroads and Rockefeller, like like this 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 is the point where public opinion really starts to uh, uh, start to get concerned about Standard Oil, in particular, uh, informed by the competitors, because the public public is like, great, like we're getting so much stuff so reliably for so cheap. This is awesome. Yep. Uh, so the railroads, maybe they they know they've maybe gone a little bit too far, and they're like, uh, guys, I don't know that we can actually do this. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> Rockefeller and Flagler, they're like. Uh, it's okay let's just like hold out for a couple of weeks i think we're gonna be fine that we're gonna go do some stuff and we'll get back to you <laughs> so during these few weeks when the this deal has not yet gone into into effect yet but rumors of it are spreading throughout the industry flagler and rockefeller go around to all the other refiners in cleveland keep in mind many of them are in very rough shape right now because like a the fluctuations, but B oil prices are getting driven down so far that like people are trying to produce and make profit on this, but like 
because of this like crazy inflation then deflation thing that happens like a lot of these companies are slowly on their way to going out of business anyway yep and they're already you like kind of in you know brought to heel by standard by the the lakeshore deal where they're already sharing capacity so now flagler and rockefeller go to them and say like you know that great rate that we organized for you it's over y'all have heard about this uh south improvement company thing it's happening uh so the way we see it you basically have two choices you can stay nominally independent and you can die or you can just sell your operations to us come in and join the fold get some standard oil shares we'll even give you stock (laughs) and then we can all profit from this amazing deal that we have and there's something larry says like rockefeller says own shares of standard oil and your family will never go hungry yeah so as ida tarbell who we're going to talk much about next time uh wrote in in uh her investigative reporting on standard oil this is what she claimed that the the standard pitch was to uh to other folks about joining this scheme uh quote you see this scheme is bound to work it means an absolute control by us of the oil business there is no chance for anyone outside but we are going to give everybody a chance to come in. You are to turn over your refinery to my appraisers, and I will give you Standard Oil Company stock or cash as you prefer for the value that we put on your business. <laughs> I advise you to take the stock. It will be for your own good. <laughs> uh, so they're literally just saying like they're deciding what value they're going to pay for all these refiners. And of course, they're, they're the offer that they put in is like 25 to 50% of book value. Yeah, what what they what the refiners even paid to build the factories in the first place. And and Rockefeller's argument is like, well, we're just going to shut most of these down anyway. I mean, we're actually doing them a favor by taking this thing that's just going to go out of business over the next few years, giving them some shares in our company as like a, you know, we don't want to be, you know, too terrible to these guys. They're our our fellow countrymen and they're also in our industry and we're just bringing them in. We're giving them some shares, and I, I you know, I'm going to write the whole thing off anyway. So it's it's a crap factory. So over a period of six weeks, <laughs> from February 1872 to April 1872, Standard Oil buys 22 of the 26 other refineries that are operating in Cleveland, <laughs> and this comes to be known as the Cleveland Massacre. <laughs> uh, and then once they already own all the refineries in Cleveland, they're like. All right, we're done. You know, we don't really even uh, need this uh, South Improvement Company thing anyway. And I guess the public doesn't like it. So um, we're not going to do it. And apparently not a single barrel was ever shipped using the South Improvement Company. Uh, I, they never documented anything but structure like that. It was all set up and agreed upon. But then they didn't actually ever need to to do it because they used it as leverage to just go and roll everyone up anyway. And this was this was the tipping point. So obviously this was you know the Cleveland refiners first, but then immediately after they go to Pittsburgh, they go to Philadelphia, they go to West Virginia. They don't even have to set up some ploy shell corporation like the South Improvement Company. They just go to all the other refiners in these cities and they're like, "Y'all heard about what happened in Cleveland?" We're coming here next, so... You want some shares? You you want some shares? Yep. (laughs) Uh, By 1877, Standard Oil controls 90% of the oil business in America. (laughs) 90%. As Barron's put it, consumers of kerosene had no choice but to purchase the product from a standard company. Not that they complained... Standard's policy was to upgrade the product continuously while lowering the costs in order to frighten away potential competitors and increase sales. I just want to say, David, like, just like TSMC, it's like, yep, I think it's something like 70% of the leading edge CPUs flow through the island of Taiwan and, you know, 50% are actually TSMC, manufactured by TSMC. And like, we're all better for it as consumers. And I think it's just fascinating, this notion of like, we're going to keep lowering prices. The product's going to keep getting better. And at the end of the day, it actually is good for consumers. Oh, and we're going to get huge and super profitable along the way. Yeah. Well, and, you know, AS, ASML and the 
uh, you know, all the equipment manufacturers. They're kind of like the railroads here. Right. Although amazingly, the uh, uh, this cooperation with the railroads really didn't lead to Standard Oil squashing the railroads. Like they stayed really good businesses for a long oh, time. Well, they did for other industries. Uh, <laughs> or at least I think they did. I don't know enough to say about the railroads. Uh, they certainly stayed independent. But, you know, Rockefeller and Flagler and this whole crew, like, these guys are paranoid as well, right? Like, they are, they do realize after they've just gone and consolidated the whole oil industry, they know that the railroads do have strategic leverage over them. Uh, And again, remember, like, the oil refiner, they let the other refiners stay in business. They just, you know, bought them (laughs) and gave them standard oil shares. They're, like, they're worried about the railroads. So, like, we don't want them having strategic leverage over us how can we co-opt them so i mentioned earlier tank cars <laughs> yeah right? what what was the deal here so right around this time standard starts going to all the big railroads and they're like you know we've saved you all this money on opex now you get to run trains directly you know no stops no box cars this is great for you but, but you know these tank cars these modern tank cars you know made of steel and the like um that's a lot of capex for you to keep building and, and we just keep sucking up all this shipping volume with y'all what if we just make these cars for you <laughs> and we lease them back to you we'll take on the capex to make the cars <laughs> and, and we'll lease them to you at a really low rate so what's the play here so Chernow writes about this He says, as the owner of almost all the Erie and New York Central tank cars, Standard Standard Oil's position grew unassailable. At a moment's notice, it could crush either railroad by threatening to withdraw its tank cars. No tank cars, no business. (laughs) You can keep running this great business for y'all, but you you mess with us, we can withdraw our tank cars. Wow. And so now they've got 90% market share of kerosene and they've got this relationship with the railroad where they basically are going to get the most favorable rates without the comp- without a railroad going out of business like they can squeeze every last bit of juice and then they take it one step further again <laughs> so while all this is going on there's a new by the way david you laughing through this like maniacal plan you're like the nicest like it's so scary because i'm like Oh, I just have implicit trust in you. Like you're so kind and you're so warm and you're so, <laughs> uh, and like, you're like, and then they take it one step further. <laughs> and then they stab the knife in the back again. And it's so great. Oh, <laughs> I just like, it's just, this is such a like good story. Uh, I love it. Not condoning this behavior by any stretch of the imagination, but. Um, An important pillar of American history. Uh, a critical part of American history. So, okay. Uh, the, they, they take it one more step further. And this is really the, the coup de grace here. So as they're doing all these deals and said, you know, and, and standard oil is becoming this octopus as it would be known, uh, uh, a derogative term, derogatory term by its critics, uh, octopus, you know, uh, like you think the Goldman Sachs vampire squid sucking on America was bad. Like <laughs> literally the standard oil octopus is bigger than 10 vampire squids. Uh, so, <laughs> there's a new technology that people are thinking about with regard to oil not gasoline not yet that's coming later but uh all of the you know the oil is being moved around either by water or on railroads people are thinking that like there might be a way to move oil much 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 more efficiently uh so the concept of pipelines already existed but really short distance pipelines uh from literally from the derricks from the from the wells to the railroad depots so this this would be like you know a mile at most uh they would pump oil through pipes to the railroad depots or to the you know shipping depots or whatever to then load it up in cars and get it out of there some people start thinking like well i wonder if we could pump oil a lot farther (laughs) than just a mile or two uh and meanwhile the remnants of the industry uh that haven't yet been consolidated by standard uh they're looking for any kind of 
you know, Hail Mary pass to get get some leverage back in the industry. So they decide that they're all going to go in together against standard and try and, and, and the railroads, they know they can't get any concessions out of the railroads. They're going to try and develop a pipeline, a long distance pipeline. So in 1877, they do this. They band together and they form the Tidewater Pipeline Company. This just sounds like a scandal right off the bat, like the name Tidewater Pipeline Company. Why would Company. you name it that? Uh, I mean, it's 1870 like I, or 1877. <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> um, and uh, they're going to... First, the goal is that they're going to uh, pipe oil from Titusville directly to Baltimore on the, on the, on the seafront. They then shorten it to Williamsport, Pennsylvania, which is still 110 miles. This would be like an amazing proof of concept that this would work. Isn't that where like the Little League World Series is? It is. It is. Yeah. I, yeah, so. I don't know why Williamsport was where they wanted to pipe this stuff to, but huh. they do end up piping it. So Standard, though, fights them tooth and nail on this. Like they're, they're like uh, <laughs> uh, a bunch of the execs want to go hire thugs to go like smash the pipeline and do all this stuff. And, and they like, do, right? Like they've like uh, the pipelines get smashed and they light stuff on fire. And uh, no, actually, Rockefeller is like he, he reins in his his exuberant execs on this and says, no, no, we're going to fight it with every like, you know, uh, political, you know, uh, leverage that we have, which they do. But they don't succeed. And in 1879, the pipeline turns on and it works. And I think a bunch of people in Standard are like, probably like pissed at John or like don't understand why he let this happen. And, you know, how could this, this be terrible? And Rockefeller is like, oh, don't worry. I have a plan. Now, remember, this is just one route that this new pipeline has opened up, you know, from Titusville to Williamsport. Rockefeller is like, I got all the railroads in my pocket. <laughs> They go around to the railroads and they tell the railroads, they instruct the railroads to cut shipping rates so far down on this line that literally like they're basically paying anybody who's willing to ship by railroad uh, on this line to, to, to ship. So it's actually the pipeline, <laughs> even though they invested all this money in building it and it's so much more efficient, so much cheaper than running a, a rail car because at Standard Oil's pressure, the railroads have now lowered prices so far in response, it's not economic to use the pipeline. So they starve them out. So this is like the the Bezos versus diapers.com thing where Bezos is like, oh, I can sell diapers at a loss forever. Like, you don't understand. That is totally what happens. So the Tidewater Pipeline Company is like up against the wall. They're about to go bankrupt. They can't compete. And by March of 1880, they sell a minority stake in the pipeline to standard oil oh, wow. <laughs> standard assumes control of the pipeline takes all the technology immediately turns around and go builds out and goes and builds out four more major pipelines from titusville to cleveland to manhattan to philadelphia to buffalo <laughs> this is the best part brutal uh so they build these you know now pipelines that are huge do you know what land they build the pipelines on this is the most cold-blooded thing in the whole freaking episode. No. Okay, so who would have land rights in straight lines oh, the between railroads. cities? <laughs> Standard Oil goes to the railroads and they're like, my friends. <laughs> <laughs> my friends. <laughs> We've got this really exciting new thing that we're working on we're friends you know you you uh we we help you you help us how about how about we use your land how about we build our pipelines <laughs> right along next to your railroads wow. and then it'll just be a little reminder sitting to you right there reminder to y'all that we don't need you <laughs> that we've built on your land <laughs> you're looking at your competition every single time you glance out of a train car so if you ever, you know, want to try and screw us on prices, wow. just remember, we've got an alternative <laughs> right there. Wow. Oh, my God. So by great. the way, do, did you do you know the deal with Sprint? Random uh, business trivia fact. Ooh, I may well, have I said this on another required episode. I think we've talked about this before. Yeah, that Sprint that a lot of uh, telephone lines were laid along rail lines. Yeah, it's the Southern Pacific Railroad, SPR. Uh, oh, yeah, that's right. That's it's right. The, 
the and and exactly for this reason like hey we need s- someone who's already eminent domain a bunch of land that we can go directly in a straight line from one city to another boom yep crazy now i i don't know for sure but I didn't see anywhere that the railroads got any like uh, equity stake in these pipelines. <laughs> oh, wow. All right. So I fully take back my comment earlier that it seems like the railroads made it out okay. Well, I think they actually did. I mean, this was kind of Rockefeller style and Standard Oil style. Is like, we're not going to, we're going to let you live. We're going to be benevolent dictators. Mm. We're going to let you continue. You're just going to remember that, you know, our knife is pressed against your back at all, at all times. Uh, yeah. Okay. So after this, uh, it's done. I mean, this is this is the story of how Standard Oil became Standard Oil. Like Rockefeller, Standard, like they have won. They have won on a scale that nobody has ever won before or since. Their competitors are obliterated. New upstart technologies are co-opted. All of the suppliers, you know, are reduced to total lackeys. Um the customer we didn't talk about the customers uh this is great so at least in america most <laughs> great <laughs> i'm now thinking about how you're you, i'm saying this is all, a this great is great. story is this is I'm a hearing. great story most kerosene was sold at retail in america in grocery stores so right or in the sort of early 1880s standard decides to run the same playbook that they've run with the railroads with the grocery stores in america uh they go to them and they say, hey, uh, you know, it's it's expensive for you to um, set up and give shelf space and everything to all of these cans that are all, you know, non-standardized of standard oil kerosene uh, in your stores. From now on, all standard kerosene needs to be sold in standard canisters that we set the terms on and we fix the price uh, and we tell you where you're going to put it in your stores <laughs> and any uh so some stores uh you know sort of bristle at this and say they're not going to do it <laughs> standard sends out a letter uh in mississippi they had a particular problem with this they send out a letter to all the grocers in mississippi they say if you do not buy our oil we will start a grocery store chain to compete with you and sell goods at cost and put you all out of business. Oh <laughs> this my is in God. writing <laughs> sent to all of them. Uh, wow. So those are the customers. Um, it's like you can just feel the American public and Washington getting stirred up about like, okay, monopolies are pretty bad. Like we really need some legislation about this. Yeah. As a, uh, as um Chernow writes, by this point in time, Rockefeller's creation could only be discussed in superlatives. It was the biggest and richest, the most feared and most admired business organization in the world. (laughs) Um, Wow. Wow. In 1883, uh, official Standard Oil headquarters moves to Manhattan, to New York City, and Rockefeller himself. 26 Broadway. To Manhattan, to 26 Broadway. Uh, do you know, which is the building that they have constructed uh, for the Standard Oil headquarters, 26 Broadway, right on Wall Street. Do you know what is right outside of 26 Broadway today? No. The bull. The charging bull on no Wall Street way. is literally right outside 26 Broadway. Uh. <laughs> I also didn't know, you know, the bull was only put there in like 1989, I think. Oh, no. I would have assumed it was there through the 80s. I totally would have thought. Yeah, it's actually hasn't. Been the, it was put there after the 1987 uh, stock market crash. Ah, uh, interesting. But uh, so Rockefeller and uh, you know his brother and all of his their lieutenants, you know, they moved to New York also around this time. <laughs> they just like buy up Midtown. Uh, so uh, they Rockefeller moves uh, to right off Fifth Avenue uh, in the 50s. Was it was a 54th Street? Maybe I actually don't have it written down. It was either like 53rd or 54th Street, right off Fifth, Fifth Avenue. He buys a house, moves in there. Uh, you know, just like, just really right there, you know, between the park and and between Rockefeller Center. You know, like, <laughs> no, there is no Rockefeller Center. They build freaking Rockefeller Center. Which he had nothing to do with. That was, no, a, it was ended up being endowed by his son, but yeah. Yeah, just why did, actually, uh, we'll probably talk about this more next time. I didn't realize it was Columbia University's campus. Um there oh. and uh when junior decided to 
get in and start building, developing and building Rockefeller Center. They lease it from Columbia and then they ultimately buy it. Fascinating. Yeah. Well, part two, I mean, we'll have a lot to say about um, universities and Rockefellers in New York. And um, I, we haven't touched a lot on the personal side of Rockefeller other than saying he was deep, re- deeply religious and um, believed he should make a lot of money <laughs> and then and then do interesting things with it. There's a lot of like very good things he does with it that I think we'll, we'll save for part two. Um, and a lot of his idiosyncratic things around like, being afraid of death and wanting to live a long time and his health obsessions. And I, I think a lot of that especially starts to to show up in his old age. But David, bring us bring us home here to 1890. Yeah. So, I mean, this is like, it's funny. We're going to, you know, recount now what will ultimately become the beginning of the the downfall of, of Standard Oil. But like, I don't know, like, it's weird being at this moment in the story because they've literally won. Like, I don't think we've ever had this before. Like, only thing that can bring them down is the government like <laughs> uh it's such a wild position uh to talk about or a paradigm shift i mean the, the other thing is like well the pipelines could have been that but then they just co-opted them well but i'm referring to like electricity and lights in houses but they very quickly were saved by the fact that conveniently right around the same time we had any thirst that we had for oil before once you have the the car, like Rockefeller got so much richer in his retirement from his shares of Standard Oil, which became, you know, the things that powered us moving around the country in cars than he ever got from kerosene. So it was like a paradigm shift could have disrupted and did disrupt the core kerosene business. But like the thing that happened at the same time was so much bigger than anything they ever could have imagined. And I, I think that Standard was also making some investments into electricity and electrical utilities. Uh, I don't know how how deep they got into the business, but... But all I'm saying is monopolies, even if you don't trust bust them, are always at risk of being disrupted by a paradigm shift. Totally fair point. Um, Not in this case, though. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) Not in this case. So... Uh, you know, it's funny. I, I always assumed, uh, you know, what I knew of the Standard Oil story before doing all the research was that it was the 1890 Sherman Antitrust Act that brought down Standard Oil. It wasn't for another 21 years. Indeed, it was. Yes, it was the Sherman Antitrust Act, but it was not for 21 years. Uh, so the we'll close with the wild story of the Sherman Antitrust Bill. So Ohio... Senator John Sherman, uh, brother of General William Tecumseh Sherman, uh, no the like, way. great hero of the Civil War. Wow. Yeah. Unbelievable. <laughs> I, th- I think, there, you know, you know how we joke about how there like must have been 10 people in Silicon Valley in like the 1970s and 1980s. Right. I think there must have been like 10 people in America at this <laughs> point in time. So Senator John Sherman, uh, as uh, in 1889, as like the sort of public sentiment is starting to shift against this huge octopus monopoly, proposes an anti quote unquote antitrust bill in the U.S. in the federal Senate. Uh, <laughs> it turns out that just a few years earlier, uh, when Sherman was running for office uh, in Ohio, <sighs> guess who one of his biggest campaign supporters was? Uh, Rockefeller. Yes, <laughs> that would be correct. So this is like, like, hmm, you're biting the hand that feeds you here. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so the act, you know, does pass, but but Sherman makes the political gamble that like the the political power and stature that he's going to get from doing this is going to be worth more than the money that he's going to get from Rockefeller and Standard going forward. The act ends up passing in July of 1890, outlawing all trusts and business combinations in the United States of America that were, this is the key modifier, quote unquote, in restraint of trade. But they don't define what in restraint of trade Mm. means. (laughs) It's just like... uh, It's up to some judge to set precedent. It's up to some judge to set precedent. And everybody thinks, oh, well, nobody's really going to... like. There's no legal precedent for what that means. So... That's never really going to become an issue. And in fact, Rockefeller and 
Standard Oil viewed this as a win. They were like, oh, great. The public is now going to feel like the U.S. government has taken action. They have Mm -hmm. uh, heard them. They're going to curtail standards power, but they're not actually going to curtail anything that we do. We're going to keep doing exactly what we've been doing. And in fact, when Sherman runs for re-election in Ohio the very next year in 1891, do you know who, once again, one of his biggest donors was? Is it? Rockefeller again. It is John D. Rockefeller. Fascinating. Once again. <laughs> uh, how funny is that? The act that ends up bringing them down. <laughs> he is the biggest or one of the biggest donors after the act passes to the senator that introduces it. Huh. Yeah. Fascinating. So, uh, so that's, you know, it. There's some there's some controversy, uh, as we alluded to, and we'll talk more about next time in the state of Ohio uh, a couple years later, but mostly it's smooth sailing. And uh, in 1896, Rockefeller is like, well, guess it's been a good run. <laughs> I'm going to hang it up. I'm going to retire. I'm going to focus on my philanthropy. Uh, and, uh, I'm going to leave one of my lieutenants, John Archbold and, uh, and my son, John Rockefeller Jr. Who's about to graduate from, uh, Brown university. I'm going to leave them in charge. I'm going to go retire to my estate and I'm going to focus on doing good works. (laughs) But key mistake. He didn't fully leave. No. No, he did not. He's like, well, just in title only, I'll kind of stick around. But of course, that's as president, right? Or as chairman. But of course, that's not how the public would view it. They're they're like, no, your name's still on the door. Oh, he's going to get dragged back to the witness stand (laughs) in the the years to come. So So no no sunset ride off for him. No, that's where we're going to leave it for now. But uh, yeah, what a story. Truly. All right, I have a few, uh, as we get into the analysis here, I have a few uh, a few fun points I want to make. But first, we want to thank the final sponsor of this episode, NordVPN. So we've talked about Nord on previous episodes. This is one where I think we used to do these community shout outs, David. This feels more like a community shout out to me than it does a sponsorship. Um, but of course, Nord is a, a, a great company and um, we do formally work with them as a as a partner, much like many other YouTubers and podcasters everywhere. So you've probably heard about them in other places. Um, but uh, you know, our, especially our thanks to to Tom Oakman and the rest of the founders there for listening to the show and um, being a part of the acquired community and and seeing in Slack. It's it's just so cool. But uh, for folks who haven't heard on other episodes, this company has a wild story behind it. It is a thousand person company that serves fifteen million people globally. That is founded in Lithuania, founded by 2012 by some childhood friends. They haven't taken a dollar of outside funding. It's totally bootstrapped. And so it's this incredible European like startup bootstrapping success story to build the huge business that they've built today. So if you're looking for a VPN service, look no further. You can sign up at nordvpn.com slash acquired by clicking the link in the show notes, and you can use a coupon code acquired at checkout. Our thanks to NordVPN. Indeed, thank you, Nord. They're almost like uh, almost like the pipeline for internet traffic. <laughs> <laughs> built <laughs> built in much more uh, much less uh, sinister, shall we David, say? David, I I listen to these sponsorships just to hear how you steer it into our episode <laughs> content. It's perfect. Uh, so great. Thank you, Tom, and everybody at Nord. I want to talk a little bit about like the we used to do these narrative sections when we do IPOs. I want to talk about like the public sentiment versus Rockefeller's defense. So like the public sentiment here, and and when we say public, it's less at this point in history the actual public and more about their competitors who are sort of making a bigger deal out of this because all the public knows is there's this really big company. Uh, they provide things kerosene mostly that I use in my life and it gets to me in a consistent way at a stable price like it's it it is good for consumers like if you think about the consumer welfare standard about uh of of antitrust like this really isn't bad for consumers it could get there if standard oil is the only company and they sort of wield that pre- that power to raise prices and stuff like that but at this point it's it's really like their competitors hate their guts. And especially anybody who's sort of 
been coerced to cooperate with them, the railroads, the pipelines, like anyone in their orbit, the the retailers, like it sucks for them too. And so you've got this beginnings of like really stirred up public sentiment against this company that's like, by some views, you know, the most evil capitalist structure of all time. I mean, the, the, the Americans, ever since we got here from England and here, <laughs> I... I, you know, my family immigrated at some point, so I certainly didn't come from England. But uh, ever since the original uh, Anglo people came over from Europe and settled America, there's been this incredible hatred of monopolies, in particular because our country was founded on like equality and and uh, the, uh, people having the right to be free and the free market. Like, we don't want this government, like the government was a monopoly in, in England, and that's what we were running from. Well, and still to this day, there's like huge skepticism amongst Americans of any political party, like of centralized government power. Right. So even there's this interesting, like very American stripe that runs through people that is, I can't quite put my finger on why, but I don't like big stuff and I don't like concentration of power. And I didn't like it when it was concentrated in a government and I don't like it now when it's concentrated in the rich people. And that shows up all the way through to today. I mean, that, that's a the defining characteristic of the national conversation now. And of course, Rockefeller's defense to all this is saying, look, social Darwinism is bad. Like, without Standard Oil rolling everyone up, you just have all these people producing non-standard products that consumers can't trust. They're going to kill this industry that could make everything great because consumers won't trust it. All these businesses will go out, go out of business because the prices are so low because every time there's a gusher, you know, the prices drop so much. These people are all going to go out of business anyway. And like Standard Oil is the antidote to social Darwinism, which is bad, which is is killing the golden goose here. And so the way he sort of makes this argument is it was a cooperative success. It was for the general good. It was our moral imperative. It was downright Christian for me to do this and provide this service. And certainly any of the you know competitors or suppliers or partners or the like who ended up taking Standard Oil stock got fabulously wealthy by doing so. Like, how could you argue that that was bad for them? He really seems to have deeply believed that this like invisible hand, the Adam Smith concept of, you know, the the invisible hand that sort of guides the the free market, that it kind of just takes too long. And there's a lot of bad stuff that happens along the way. Like academically, sure, it makes sense that the free market will work itself out. But like when you actually look at the businesses today and the people running those businesses today, there's going to be a bunch of hardships and dirt along the way. You might have whole industries that die out because they never sort of reach their full potential. Like he, he very much, it's not communist. Like, it, and it's not real. It's not social. It's, it's this interesting, like, uniquely American viewpoint on actually social Darwinism and free market capitalism is a bad thing. And everybody just eating each other's lunch and, and eliminating all the profit in every industry uh, and, and potentially to our own detriment is bad. Uh, yeah. And, you know, um, Chernow even, even talks about this, like in, in some ways, uh, what, what Rockefeller was trying to do and what Standard became shared just as much um you know intellectual grounding as with like marx and communism as it did with adam smith and capitalism like uh it was uh um it was this view that like hey pure individual competition is not actually like the most ideal status and like some form of collectivism in this case collectivism in the form of a company standard oil uh was the best path yeah and the place where it kind of falls down is where he sort of says like look if we just knife fight to the death someone's gonna win and ultimately that one is gonna be me because i'm the best at this and like he's probably right but this notion of like so therefore everyone should allow me to save them at truly in like a very, you know, evangelical Christian way. Like I'm going to go and save, you know, and, and bring them into my 
business church is is very much how he sort of thought about it. And you come into the light and and embrace the standard oil. <laughs> Literally the light. I love it. And you know, just dripping with irony in the way that I'm drawing these these parallels yeah. here. Oh, can we talk about the standard oil logo while we're while we're at it? Yeah, one second. The uh, I, and we should get to that. The it kind of falls down where like him accelerating the death of all of these businesses and saying eh, it was inevitable and at least they're getting some upside now the benevolence argument does seem to fall down there a little bit yeah i uh i mean so like it, perhaps maybe the most blatant example to me is uh the grocers right like that letter <laughs> sent out totally in writing to grocers saying like if you don't do what we want we are going to literally burn down your houses you know metaphor well we are going to metaphorically burn down your houses like it's unreal right there there are places where like it, it made sense for him to exert his power to reorganize the industry for the betterment of all the producers involved and all the consumers but those places are far more limited than the number of places where they actually reached and exerted their power. Yep. Uh, sidebar on the on the logo because it's yeah. uh, so great. It, it's this like we'll, we'll see if we can link to it in the show notes. Uh, it, you'll recognize it when you see it. It's this red, white, and blue. Oh, it's the Amico oh. logo now. Yeah, it's the it's the Amico logo. Yeah, yeah. Uh, which was Amico was uh California that standard of Ohio. Oh wait, no, California uh, was Chevron. That's was that there Ohio or New Jersey? Uh, I think it was Ohio that became Amico. I could be wrong I on that. I think you're right. I'll fact check that while you're... Um, but yeah, it's this red, white, and blue oval with, in the middle of the oval, this like Grecian column-looking torch, like Olympic torch-looking... Indiana. Uh, Indiana. Oh, interesting. Uh, like Olympic torch-looking, uh, you know, column with with a fire burning on top of it, like... And interestingly, I think the Standard Oil of Indiana company adopted a different logo, but then when oh. they turned into Amico, they adopted a something that looks a lot more like the original Standard Oil logo. Interesting. Interesting. The other thread I want to talk about here in narratives is <sighs> Rockefeller and Standard Oil as an organization, but Rockefeller as a person is really like the prototype of so much of american culture today like he is he was simultaneously viewed as this like you know sinister villain and as this great hero and like people you know people hated him but people wanted to be him <laughs> and i feel like like everything <laughs> is that, that a rap like, lyric I, yeah, I feel yeah, like that's. Like, <laughs> I feel like it must be. Well, I mean, Jay Z would name uh, you know his uh, his label Rockefeller Records. Like yep. you know, there's a reason for that. Uh, but um, <laughs> but like everything that like I feel like the public feels about you know Bezos, Zuckerberg, Musk, you know, like everybody, all these billionaires today. Like this was the prototype. This was the first time that Americans felt this way. There's um there's this great quote in, in, in Titan uh, that says. The general public was of two minds and viewed the new entrepreneurs, of which Rockefeller was the foremost, as alternatively sinister and heroic. By 1888, Rockefeller began to pop up in fawning magazine features about rich Americans, but he was also singled out as a notorious trust king in Joseph Pulitzer's world and other papers. The press kept up an editorial drumbeat against Standard Oil demanding vigorous state and federal antitrust action at the same time that he's in like the equivalent of, you know, like Vanity Fair as like the new elite. And I think he started embracing that later, like uh, for a while, his policy was don't talk to the press. And then sort of later started opening up to this idea of like, geez, maybe it's probably a good idea for me to have a positive image out there. Like silence is not doing me any favors. Yeah. All right. Power. Ooh, Power. Okay, so what are what are our power categories here? So uh, as as Hamilton Helmer would uh, put forth in his wonderful book Seven Powers: Counter Positioning, Scale Economies, Switching Costs, Network Economies, Process Power, Branding, and Cornered Resource. And what I would uh, put forth here is I think, and I haven't rigorously looked at each one. I think Standard Oil at various points in its first. 
20, 25 years of existence exerted every single one of these, but the domineering one, the one that enabled them to do everything that they did was scale economies. Yeah. I th- No argument from me on scale economies being the most important one here. I mean, literally that was all the machinations with the competitors, with getting with getting the volume in the Lakeshore deal, uh, with doing the deals with the railroads. It was all about it was all about economies of scale. So for sure. Uh yeah, did they use all of the others? What do you th- what's what's your thought on counter positioning? I think in being a pure play refinery that was located mm. in a different location than the uh, th- than like is there a the reason producers. that no, no one else should have done an offsite refinery because they had too much vested interest in an onsite refinery? I'm not sure. Mm. That's a good question. I I'm not sure that it was there was any reason why they couldn't but I think all the folks who are in the producing world, like the drilling and the crude world, they were just so, it was just such a gold rush mentality that like. It was not professionalized. Yeah. Yeah. It was not, well, it was not professionalized. They were just, they were just chasing the quick profits and like they were distracted. They weren't thinking long term, but I, I don't think there was any reason why they couldn't have yeah. set up refining businesses in other, in other locations. The counter positioning feels a little thin. Yeah. All the others that like switching costs <laughs> for sure uh, with the, all the railroad deals and then the tank cars and all that um, network economies. Yeah. I mean, they build uh, like the, the, the retail distribution with the standard cans and the, um, uh, but actually, is that all scale economies though? Is there any network effect here where it's better mm. for one customer that other customers exist like do, do any does anybody ever sort of have a relationship between customers well, that's a good question maybe not i mean network economies were certainly less common in a pre-telephone era yep yeah maybe not maybe that's more of a stretch process power certainly especially over time as it got yep. more and more complicated um branding i mean they named themselves standard and then they <laughs> became that <laughs> yep yep uh, and then, yeah, I mean, they had lots of cornered resources. Eventually they cornered the resource on they, all the crude in the Eastern United States. Cause did, did they, so they, they eventually actually owned all the land rights, right. To actually produce the, yeah, they did eventually get into exploration and production. Um, I think when it was, you know, it was much later, I want to say it was in the 1880s, 1890s, maybe when big oil deposits started being discovered elsewhere in America. Yeah, um, and then they get they got in into that in in bigger ways. Fascinating. Um, okay, you cool with moving to playbook? Let's do it. So I have one playbook theme that we didn't d- touch enough the rest of the episode, and I have sort of a long quote, but I wanna I wanna say it from um, uh, from Chernow's book here. And this is in particular around the period where lots of uh, there's a lot of fluctuation in prices. There's a race to the bottom. Lots of people are going out of business. And this is sort of Rockefeller, um, you know, sort of uh, you know talking about how they're going to weather the storm and you know swallow everyone else up. What made an expeditious shutdown of outmoded rivals vital to Rockefeller was that he borrowed heavily to build gigantic plants so that he could drastically slash his unit costs. Even his first partner, Maurice Clark, remembered that the volume of trade was always what he regarded as paramount importance. Early on, Rockefeller realized that the capital-intensive refining business, in this business, sheer size mattered greatly because it translated into economies of scale. Once describing the foundation principle of Standard Oil, he said it was the theory of the originators. The larger the volume, the larger the opportunities for the economies, and consequently, the better the opportunities for giving the public a cheaper product without the dreadful competition of the late 60s ruining the business. During his career, Rockefeller cut the unit costs of refined oil almost in half, and he never deviated from the gospel of industrial efficiency. Mm. There's so much tied up here, but one of them is this is kind of the first venture capital business. Like we talked a lot on the TSMC episode about these massive fixed costs. I mean, they're investing $100 million in fabs over the next three years. 
And then it's all a volume game. Like how much can you get the plants at full capacity as fast as possible? Because the the unit costs can can be super small because your your variable costs are super low, but it's all about that gigantic capital investment of the fixed costs. I love it. There's the TSMC payoff. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> there two hours later. <laughs> you know, the other thing that uh that I was just thinking the whole time as you were reading that quote was uh was Andreessen, Mark Andreessen, strength leads to strength, right? Like this is the original strength leads to strength business. Totally. And this is this is him justifying rolling up all these other producers where he's basically like, look, we got to the, the best thing for consumers is to run as much consumer demand through one capital structure as possible so we can just absorb all the fixed costs and then make the variable costs as, as low as possible. Yeah. It'd be fun to think about. We're on such a kick here with this these like types of businesses. Is there is there ever a kind of business or industry where like this this uh broader max so not scale economies per se, but this broader maxim of strength leads to strength. Is that ever not the case? Uh it's always the case, I think, but it's like in in varying strokes. Like especially where industry industries where there's not fixed costs or where there's low fixed costs. Like think about a restaurant business. Like sure there's the there's like, you know, you have to assuming that you don't own the building and you're you're leasing everything and you even lease the equipment, then you're like, geez, what is really the, you know, the capex? You're kind of just like at the whim of can you produce a better product and get a little bit more margin than your, you know, the person down the street. Yeah, or maybe uh, maybe this is uh, kind of similar to the, it also would apply to the restaurant business like any time where if you're competing on like uh uh the highest end of quality uh like uh like um something's got to be really boutique I, i'm thinking like a fine dining restaurant like that's a kid where strength might lead to strength in terms of its brand but if it were to like raise a bunch of capital expand Go have a you know uh, a bunch more restaurants. Oh, about if town. your value like, is scarcity, then yeah, yeah it's exactly. Value destructive you, yeah, to- yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. That's a that's a case where strength wouldn't lead to strength in the same way. But so many venture capital <laughs> businesses and businesses that scale as large as we're talking about in the last few episodes, we've been talking about like <laughs> the largest businesses the world has ever known. Um, yeah, it's amazing how this dynamic applies. Totally. Well, for grading on this one, listeners, we are going to combine value creation, value capture, and grading. Um, We already talked a lot about the component of this value creation section where how does the value created for the world compare to value destruction? I think we talked a lot about that in this episode, but we haven't spent a lot of time on like how does the value that Standard Oil created compare to the value that they captured for themselves, which I think is sort of the the interesting one to look at here. And like a terrible example is Wikipedia, where there's no company that creates any more value in the world, but captures so little of it. Whereas you look at a Google and they create a lot of value, but they're enormously profitable based on it. And so uh, some some interesting numbers uh, with, with Standard Oil. So we know that they, you know, um, you know, we're responsible for this sort of like kerosene boom in the United States and uh, and and the world. And I think let's save the gas car conversation for for the next episode. And I absolutely want to have a conversation around climate. And I think we should save that for the next episode too. But in this one, let's let's just look at the shape of the business by this this period of time. So, Standard Oil in the mid 1880s employed a hundred thousand people, which that's probably the first time a company ever employed 100,000 people. Like governments probably did, but did corporations? It would be hard to imagine, uh, especially in a world where there are only 30 million people in the United States. Totally. They had dividends of between 50 and 200% to all shareholders per year, which of course were private shareholders. It was mostly Rockefeller and his partners. That's just like, uh, I just want to underline that again. That's just like, (laughs) <laughs> that is balling out of control. <laughs> like, <laughs> That's a very, very profitable business. Oh my God. The amount of capital invested in the business, literally anywhere from half to two times that, being dividended out to shareholders every single year while you continue investing capital and growing. Ball so hard. 
<laughs> they want to find you. Yep. Uh, and then the last thing I want to throw out is um, it, it, this period between 1890, where we're ending this episode, to 1900, they grew tremendously. So they had annual earnings where we're leaving the story off of somewhere between 10 and $20 million, which inflation adjusted is like a 30x. So it's really like three to 500 million in terms of the amount of earnings profit that they were generating per year in today's dollars. By 1900, they 6x'd that. So over a decade, they actually grew tr- tremendously. So it sort of depends whether we're thinking about the business in this ten to twenty million dollar era or in the like sixty plus million dollar era, you know, by by the turn of the century. But I think that gives you a good shape of like this is a business that was spitting off cash, David, the way that you were just just describing for us, that employed a hundred thousand people, that kept America and Europe's lights on. Uh, and, uh, and like, I, I don't, I don't, because it's been so long since this happened, we don't have like SEC filings telling us, uh, the, here's literally the amount of, <laughs> of value they were able to capture versus create. But I think the way I would sort of look at this one and talk about this is, uh, you can tell from the business practices that we've harped on this and this entire episode that every time they created value, they looked around to capture every single scrap of it that they possibly could rather than let consumer surplus exist or their competitors participate in the upside that they were creating or partners. Well, and I think even um, the numbers that we have, uh, scant uh, data such as it is, again, wish we had pitch book back in the day <laughs> but uh the numbers that we have i think are also misleading like because to you know they do seem a little small you're like wait a minute you guys are talking about how this is a business on the scale that no other business in america has ever been before but inflation adjusted you know even in by 1900 you're talking about a few billion dollars of cash flow like that's dwarfed by companies today but i don't think these numbers tell the whole story because so much of the capital in this business was a being recycled and b not accounted for because of the crazy decentralized trust structure um we'll talk about this much more in the next episode but when it ultimately gets broken up you know you said at the top of the show <laughs> the the children companies that come out of standard oil exxon mobile chevron the the bulk of of BP British Petroleum now like <laughs> Amco like all of these companies um you know it wasn't until the rise of the fang era in the last 10 to 15 years before that Exxon Mobil was by far the largest market cap company in the world and that was just one of the children that came out of this company like the value that was tied up here was immense that's a much better way to look at it you're right I also think inflation adjusting these things is probably the wrong way to look at it. I was thinking about this more in the context of uh, Rockefeller's personal wealth, which we'll uh, dissect in depth on the next uh, the next installment here. But uh, sure, you can inflation adjust wealth and you can inflation adjust profits, but really what you should be doing is looking at them as a percentage of the GDP at that time. Mm, right. And, and so like, let's look at 1900. So standard oil in 1900 produced 60 million dollars in earnings and rather than inflation adjust that let's look at it relative to the total gdp which was 24 billion dollars okay so 60 million dollars divided by 24 billion dollars so 0.25 percent of the entire country's gdp is standard oils profits (laughs) <laughs> and I suppose GDP really would Apple be dollar. based on That's revenue. revenue. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, assuming they had, I don't know, 33% operating margins, I'm kind of pulling a number well, out of thin air, but that feels I'm reasonable. I'm wondering, though, I'm wondering, I don't know how they're defining profits here. I don't think this is gap accounting. Gap accounting doesn't even exist at this point in time. <laughs> that might be That might be the dividend, the annual dividend. Oh, the earnings being yeah. the... No, yeah. the dividend because the data source we pulled this from had dividends differently. Uh, let's okay. assume 
that 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 Standard Oil's revenue represented something like one percent of America's GDP, probably wow. a little bit shy, but something like that. Uh, th- that I think is the right way to frame the amount of like <laughs> the amount of money that was flowing through this one company at the time. Yeah. Wow. That is a that is a significant scale. Yep. So I think you know, the question is that you know that we wanted to ask on grading is like. <sighs> Standard Oil becoming a monopoly in this way versus if the industry were to have played out with unfettered individual competition. Which, of course, is a counterfactual that we have no idea, but how can we get a sense of what the shape of that could have looked like? You know, it's interesting. This really, like, this makes me think about uh, China and what's going on in China right now. Um, You know, I think the uh, Chinese political economic philosophy is. Uh, really aligned with the standard oil view of the world, right? Which is that like, uh, hey, unfettered competition is fine in the early days of an industry. Uh, But then you got to come in and you got to like consolidate it. You can consolidate it through the government's hand in the case of China. In this case, uh, it was through Rockefeller's hand. (laughs) Um, But uh, uh but that's what you need to enter uh, a phase of maturity in an industry. And as we were just saying, you know, Rockefeller's argument is like all of this was good for consumers. This was great for consumers. This was great for America. It's like in the most recent Amazon letter to shareholders when uh, Jeff Bezos calculates the amount of consumer surplus. You know, the the amount like he's like, if you look how much Amazon shareholders have profited on us existing, Amazon employees have profited, and Amazon customers, it's by far the customers who have won. Yes. Ah, oh, so good. But Bezos, like the, student of history. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, Ro- Rockefeller is making the same point here. I think it's really interesting. Yeah. Yeah, so, what would have happened? I mean, I think there's probably, a, um, again, counterfactual, impossible to know, but there is definitely a world where the kerosene industry doesn't develop in anywhere near uh, the same scale or or impact or size. And again, ups and downs there too. Like if you're looking at things purely from a climate perspective, you'd say, well, yeah, that would be better. Although then you'd have like more decentralized craziness with people dumping gasoline into rivers. I, like, I, I don't, don't know. know. I'm going to throw this out there and say, I think the world would end up in no, uh, no different of a place. I think mm. it would have been totally net even and the only difference would be that the you know rockefeller family foundation wouldn't be as large i think give Mm. or take a few years i think the whole thing would have played out pretty similarly and we would have ended up in the same sort of uh major players in the oil world that we have today yep and maybe maybe all of the you know, the the standard oil children, the Exxons, the Mobiles, the Chevrons, et cetera. That could have would, been independent have Cleveland anyway. refiner, yep, you know, growing exactly. on their own and not being a part of standard oil and then having to get spun out. Yep. That's a good point. That's a really good point. I mean, Rockefeller was a genius in so many levels. He brought the like Morris Chang level of thought uh, and discipline to the business. But eventually other people would have done that too. Uh Yep. You know, he's not unique. Yep. I mean, it might have been a little more annoying where like you had to get uh there you know, those two types of kerosene sitting next to each other on the shelf and you had to go make sure to buy the compatible one for whatever apparatus lamp you had at home and that would have been a slight bummer. But like, I don't know. I I I think uh Rockefeller made a lot of arguments that served his purpose. And as fun as it is to sort of imagine and uh, and sort of theory craft why why he was right and how that would have played out, I think net net we would have consumed about the same amount of oil between then and now. Consumers would have spent about the same amount of money on oil between then and now, and we would have about the same number of players we have today. Hmm. So let's see if I can translate right. It sounds like you're you're arguing for like a grade of like a C, like a passing grade, like. Middle oh it, well it depends what we're grading like do, oh, do, right. in, in if, terms if, of if creating a bunch of value and capturing uh, as well, much as uh, it no, possibly no, could a plus <laughs> right 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 uh in terms of the grade of like um the development of this industry in america uh as it did 
versus a non-standard oil path. Yeah, I guess that is what I'm arguing. What do you think? I'm not feeling strongly any different way. I think that's a, uh, I think that's a really good argument. Um, you know, it's funny. I feel like if Peter Thiel were here as a guest with us, he would be vehemently arguing the opposite. Uh, that uh, uh, you know, it's it's the zero to ones. It's the like, yes, anybody could have done this. Yes, you know, other people might have, but like Rockefeller did it. <laughs> Um, right and in the absence of somebody doing it uh then it might not have happened and without all this standardization in the oil industry then we wouldn't have had all the unbelievable lifestyle upgrades that we've all had over the last 150 years because of the advent of a unified oil ecosystem yeah yeah like you like your electric cars and Teslas and the like. Well, <laughs> you know, no kerosene back in the day, no gasoline thereafter. You know, we don't advance to the level of technology and development. You know that we're that we're at now. Oh, like I mean, people just you know, if if the car was much more inconvenient to drive, or that waited another thirty years to develop. I mean then like there's a zillion knock-on effects of uh, America doesn't innovate in all sorts of other ways and people don't have a lot of other products that we all take for granted in our lives now. Yep. All right, so I think my answer, uh, I don't have a strong point of view. I think I'm going to go a notch higher than you to a B um, just because I really do see both sides here. Uh, both one side being the argument that like this all would have happened the same way anyway and the other side being <laughs> yeah but like you need rockefeller like no rockefeller it doesn't happen um mostly though the the other reason i'm gonna go with b is i just really love telling this story <laughs> <laughs> well that that i could tell uh, that i could tell all right carve outs carve outs I, let's do it two for me both are related the first more related than the second the first one is uh, the movie There Will Be Blood with Daniel uh-huh. Day-Lewis. If you are jonesing for some uh, uh, good old-fashioned, extremely violent uh, early oil days, I think it's like an unbelievable... I mean, I wasn't there, so I have no idea, but unbelievable articulation of what it would be like to go and prospect an oil field and the risks involved in that and the personalities involved in that and the deception and the the way that, um, you know... Uh, rogue entrepreneurs were organizing labor to and, and capital yeah. to make these things happen it's like i haven't I, I saw the movie maybe six months ago but i i thought about it so many times yeah especially in regards to like titus phil and some of those in uh um in researching this and my second is only tangentially related because it is actually about a gold rush not the oil rush but the tv show deadwood with timothy uh-huh. oliphant I am I've heard like, that that's very good. It's excellent. I am one of three seasons in right now. I just finished the first season. It's so good. The characters are so compelling. The acting's great. Uh, I actually got uh, tipped to it when I was doing the research for um, the Andreessen and Horowitz episode. Uh, Mark, I think, mentioned that it was his favorite TV show. And so ah. I was like, oh, I should check that out if it's Mark Andreessen's favorite TV show. That's, it sure used enough, to be um, it's awesome. the Halt and Cast Fire uh, oh, show, really? right? Yeah, Which is also a- great. Yeah, he talks. I've never seen it, but which I mean, given what we do here, I need to. I need you to do, watch it. You do, you do. So uh, go watch Deadwood. It's it's awesome. Nice, love it. And uh, there will be blood. I I said I've never seen it. I'm like so. Oh man, under a you rock. need to see that in Gangs of New York. Yeah, like, which I but, also have never seen. Huh. That's so, uh, it wasn't um my uh, there will be blood. It's set in California, right? Uh it's somewhere out west. Yeah, that, that sounds right. I think uh, I think it is. I think it's set in uh, uh, Southern California. But anyway, uh, my carve out is completely unrelated. I'm sure I could think of some. <laughs> <laughs> the The standard oil octopus tentacles reach so far that I probably could think of some connection, but uh, but I'm not going to. Uh, is the um, the secret base YouTube channel, which is part of SB Nation uh the uh sports uh uh news website uh it's 
so good and in particular uh there I've, I've liked this uh this channel of their work for a long time these guys are so uh they just do like irreverent histories of like sports moments and teams um in particular they just did a seven part series on the atlanta falcons uh it's probably <laughs> like five or six hours in total uh and it's so good it's so funny and just like so um <laughs> the whole like premise of the history is they uh they take um uh they do a lot of great graphics on the channel so they take the um a visual representation of the win loss uh differential uh for the team where like you know if the the horizontal x the x axis is a 500 record and then going down below is yep. losing and then going up, up above is is a winning overall record and basically the whole history of the Atlanta Falcons, their wing, <laughs> as they call it, because it's all, you know, losses down into the red, almost exactly mirrors the Falcons logo. <laughs> and if you like tilt the tilt it up on its side so that the, the X axis becomes vertical, it really looks like the Falcons logo. <laughs> Brutal. It's so uh, it's so funny. But yeah, very, very well done. Highly recommend. Sorry to any Falcons fans out there. Oh, but it's like a love letter to to <laughs> Atlanta and the Falcons. Like it's 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 so fun. They did actually did one. Uh, I don't think I made this my carve up, but they did one on the Mariners uh, a year or two ago. Ah, that was equally equally yeah, good. Equal, we'll, we'll link to that one too. Equally unpretty. Yep. All right, well, listeners, thank you for joining us on part one of this epic journey. We are excited to take you on part two here. Uh, we are very interested in your feedback in between episodes, and I think we're going to leave ourselves enough time to make sure we have this out in the wild before recording the next one. So join us in the Slack to come talk about it, acquired.fm slash Slack. Email us at acquiredfm uh, or acquiredfm at gmail.com or uh, tweet at us at acquiredfm on Twitter. And uh, if you like this, share it with a friend. If you uh, are in the oil and gas industry, we'd love your perspective. I think... You know, I'm very interested to, to learn from folks uh, who this is their bread and butter. And I think Absolutely. with that, thank you to Pilot.com, the greatest bookkeeper since John D. Rockefeller John D. himself, <laughs> PitchBook and NordVPN. And uh, listeners, we'll see you next time. We'll see you next time. Who got the truth? Is it you? Is it you? Is it you? Who got the truth now? Huh.